I think we're live. Hi. All right. Uh, hey, everybody on Facebook and on YouTube. So I know I haven't been on YouTube for a really, really long time. So this will be the first video uh, being uploaded onto YouTube right after we're done with our discussion. And let me share it in a couple of places before we begin, okay? Because it needs to, to go where it needs to go. All right, so just bear with me and we'll let people get into the chat. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's, That's happening. Lot, lots of folks. That's happening. Okay, so we're going to share it in the magical solution. Oh, we're getting lots of love. Hi, Nancy. Hi, everybody. All right, so we got that. We're going to post it in the actual, um, in my group. Boom. And then I believe I can post it in an event. Can I post it in an event? No, I cannot. <laughs> That's okay. Never mind. We're good. We're fine. Every, everyone will, who needs to see it will see it. Shortly. Exactly. Which reminds me, like I said, if you're unable to find us here on Facebook Live, you can always check the... YouTube page and the YouTube page is the magical solution and you can find this interview there now I'm trying to get back to it oh god here we there go is. perfect okay yes we have everyone in here hi Fred hi Stacy Lydia Adrian Archie oh my goodness this is too much fun okay so let's get started so I'm really, really excited. So today's discussion, this evening's discussion, is entitled the, high, the White Supremacy, the Hijacking of Paganism. And I am so excited to have Professor Waheba here to come and speak to us. So I am going to quickly read her bio and we can get started. How are you feeling? Good? <laughs> we've, we've got our wine here. We are ready we're, to go, you guys. We, seriously. We, 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 we're stoked. <laughs> if we start stuttering and stumbling on words, you know why. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so Professor Wham, it's like your, your, um, your acronym, right? That's my Which acronym. Which stands for Weheba Hadia al Mui. Did I say that correctly? You said that just perfect. Oh, that's awesome. So, Professor Wham will walk us through the history of heathenism, Northern European folk traditions, and their stories. This is just sort of my introduction before I get into her bio. We will then discuss the mid 70s, 80s American Astero pagan scene, exploring the who, what, why, when, and where's of white supremacy and examining its impact on paganism locally and as a whole. We will also talk about how many heathen organizations are banding together to stop the rise of these regimes and what you can do to help. We will end the discussion by guiding the listeners to links, authors, organizations, and helpful resources for your exploration. So, Dr. Wham, Professor Wham, Weheba earned her PhD in American Studies and is an independent scholar specializing in American religious spiritual movements and the paranormal in pop culture. She lives in the Mid-Hudson Valley, New York, where she writes, teaches history and social sciences at local colleges, does data analysis for non-for-profits, and is a co-host on the paranormal radio broadcast, Church of Mavis. She also reads runes and leads workshops on a variety of spiritual metaphysical topics at local venues and is an occasional musician and performer. Wahebo was introduced to the runes through a Swedish Finnish traditional family practitioner over 35 years and has been a practitioner of the sea and a ceremonial magician. She has also been trained in Buddhism, Sufism, and the Jewish Kabbalah by traditional teachers. Woo! I've done a lot. <laughs> Welcome. Done a lot. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Right. I am so Just excited. excited. Look at all the notes. <laughs> notes. Yeah, we're going to be going in, in, you guys. Yeah. We yeah. are going in. So yeah. really quick, can you guys hear us all? Everyone is saying hello, and that's awesome, but can you hear us? That's really important. Just to make sure. So give yeah. us a thumbs up. Give us Tell a, us yes. Tell us, because we've got, okay. Because we've got these special little new. Um, I got fancy. Fancy, fancy <laughs> little microphones here. So. I got make fancy. Sure, make sure that we can be heard by everyone. 
So when so we decided to come together to actually do this live broadcast because of a couple of articles that we were seeing coming out in 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. There's one by um, Vice.com mm -hmm. and there was one by The Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I believe right, that those were right. the two. And you know, they were discussing the, the topics of their of their articles were the hijacking of paganism by white supremacy. So you and I had read these articles and you know we definitely felt that we needed to kind of comment on it and talk about it. Right. Um, so if you guys have not yet read those articles, I'll be adding the links to those in the uh, video description. So be sure to check those articles out before proceeding further. If you haven't now during the Facebook Live, don't worry about it. Just just hang in there. You got this. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So what ended up happening was we we created this event, and my husband created a um, a flyer for this event that I noticed got a lot of feedback. Oh, yeah. A lot of comments. You got some too, right? Yes, I did. I did. But most of the people that were giving me feed feedback really liked the poster or thought it was oh, awesome. or thought it was really provocative in really good ways. Good. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. I was getting kind of the mixed signals. So I had a lot of people that really didn't understand why I used a lot of the symbols that we used and, you know, why we used certain words um, in the poster. So I kind of wanted to address that first because I feel like those people definitely had some concerns. And I, I want to I wanna address that with you guys. So I'm going to give you my take on why we made the poster the way we, put, we made it. And then I would love to hear your opinion on what you thought when you first saw that poster as well. Right. So originally, my husband absolutely loves North mythology, and um, so when he was told and commissioned to do this poster, he was super, super excited to do this. And he felt the best way to represent this idea of white supremacy and this idea of being sort of like a menace in society would to would to be was was to use a traditional menacing symbol throughout folklore throughout fairy tales which was the wolf mm -hmm. and so he had chose that for that reason but he also had a very good understanding of the wolf in Norse mythology which I'll let you comment on that um, and so that was what that represented was the the infiltration of white supremacy. And then we had the two crows. And the two crows belong to who? Well, the ravens. Actually. Ravens. The ravens. And they, those are Odin's ravens. They're Odin's ravens. And so we chose those um, to sort of represent this idea of kind of fighting back against that wolf and sort of um, protecting what was there and what was theirs. And so if you notice, there's a lot of symbolism going on in the poster as well. The wolf had a, what we like to think of as like a charm bracelet. And any girl who's ever had a charm bracelet knows that like the whole point is to collect as many charms as possible. Mm -hmm. And so that was the whole point was to make the wolf seem like someone who's collecting these charms and collecting these symbols for their use. And he was going after the last two symbols that the ravens had around their neck. And so there was a there's a war going on basically is what we were trying to exemplify in this poster. So what Heba, when when you first saw the poster, how did you feel about it? What were those symbols to you when it first came out? Well, um, I, I thought that it was a, a, a very interesting evocation of a particular aspect of a wolf. Um, wolves are important in Northern European mythology, but they're important in lots of different ways. You know, Odin has his wolves. He has two wolves. And then there are two wolves that chase the sun. Mm. And then there is the, there is the giant wolf that is the kind of illegitimate spawn of Loki that is released at the end of days, right before Ragnarok. And what's important to understand about all these wolves is that, you know, when we, when, when those things, when we see like a statue of Odin or we see like a picture of Odin and we see him with his two wolves, we often just see the two wolves, you know, and wolves are wolves are wolves. Right. But the fact is, is that in the, the traditional sources that are often used, you know, as the mythological sources for people, all these different wolves have different names and these different names are really, really important. 
uh, and they're and oftentimes they're not translated in the original you know when when you get it like a translation of the poetic edda where these animals or these beings are named they're just given a name so you don't really know what their names mean mm. and that's actually vital to understand because um when i actually wrote down all the names to make sure that i remembered um, <laughs> Um, so just to give you a sense of the different the different the different names um, the the Sun so let's just talk about the Sun being pursued by the wolves the Sun who is usually represented as a goddess in at least Germanic Scandinavian mythology there are other Baltic peoples like the Finns and the Sami and uh, certain Slavic peoples where the Sun is sometimes represented in a more masculine or neuter way but at least in some, most of the Germanic forms, the sun is a feminine, um, care, um, feminine energy. And she is being pursued by two. So she represents like life, obviously, right. you know, the life force and, you know, resurrection, if you will. And she's being pursued by the two wolves whose names mean mockery and hatred. Mm. That's what their names mean. Mm. Now, in the stories, she's never caught, okay, by these wolves. She's never caught. Um, and these are distinguished from the wolves that Odin has side by side with him. And his, his, um, uh, his two wolves are named Gary and Freki. And that means, one means action and desire. Mm. And it's understood that action and desire are being controlled by Odin, whose name means, it has a lot of different um, meanings, but it means things like ecstasy and consciousness and higher states of consciousness and inspiration, you know, like the kind of inspiration that can lead to intellectual leaps and, and to poetic creative endeavors, mm -hmm. you know. So that's, that's what the word Odin really means. It comes from a, a root word regardless of whether you're looking at Vo Wotan or Votan or Woden or any of the, you know, the linguistic forms that may occur in. That's what the root means. So it's, it's this kind of consciousness that is controlling action and desire. Wow. Okay. Um, and then the big wolf, though, when I saw the poster, this wolf reminded me of the wolf that is Loki's spawn, his mm -hmm. illegitimate spawn. Um, who is supposed to be released at the end of days. Uh, and, uh, and he's actually, in, according to the stories, he's been bound um, for you know, however long, millennia. He's been bound uh, and was bound originally by the god Tyr, whose name literally just means God, but it also is cognate with like Deus and Theo, you know, it comes from the same root as that. But it also has a connotation in the Germanic language of being connected to the stars and having mm -hmm. a kind of sense of righteousness and righteous law about it. So, Interesting. Um, so basically righteousness or this righteous law and order um, fettered or contained this this wolfish creature whose name is Fenrir or Fenris, which in in um, Icelandic and Norwegian means greed. Mm, greed. So it means greed. So wow. so basically, at, in the stories, at the end of days, Odin, who of course is higher states of consciousness and creativity and all these things, um, according to the stories. Uh, he during and right before the uh, the total advent of Ragnarok, which is the end of days, um, he will be consumed by, by greed. greed. By greed. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that if you continue on in that story, Odin is destroyed. This world is destroyed, but he is avenged by his son Vidar, who overcomes the wolf of greed. And his and Vidar's name means it, it literally means expanding wood, and what that has to do with is there was this there was this notion in Nor in Germanic mythology, and you find this in Celtic um, thought as well, that trees represented a a way of expressing the um, human consciousness in that they always grow until they die, you know, mm -hmm. so they're always like expanding. Yes. They're always, you know, they're always like expanding and growing. And so 
um, vidar or expanding wood actually means expanding consciousness. Now, what's interesting about this story is that she, he was, he is the son of Odin and the son of a giantess whose name means truce. Wow. And, and he overcomes and overthrows um, greed. And that is what permits a new world to be born. Wow. So, I mean, if you're what these are what the, these are what the names mean, right? These are what the names Which, mean. But I mean, in terms of the poster, it really just adds right. a deeper, you know, this idea of the wolf being this menacing concept, which we originally put it in there for, but then to find that extra layer of greed as well, it is just, it, when you had first told me that my mind just blew. Right. And then specifically as well, the ravens. Right. You know, the two symbols that are on the raven's neck, we had chose um, for very specific reasons. Mm -hmm. And and I, I would love for you to kind of embellish that and, and talk about that as right. well. Now, the, the ravens themselves, those are Odin's ravens, and um, their names mean thought and memory. Which I did, we didn't know that. They, we just knew they were Odin's ravens, and that right. would be a great defense against the wolf. You know, we had no idea of that deeper element of what their names actually meant. That's, it was a beautiful thing. Right. It, it, I mean, thought and memory. And, uh, and of course, those are the, those are the ravens that Odin sends out when he is, you know, when he's traipsing around, he's always traipsing around, you know, he's <laughs> always searching, he's always like journeying. And, 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 and they of course go out and they bring him back information, you know? Right. And so, um, now, in terms of the symbols, if I recall, the symbol that Fenris has gotten, he has gotten the swastika. The swastika. Um, and, of course, that, that's as, that symbol is, you know, that symbol is a symbol that is, of course, due to its association um, with the Nazi regime. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Yeah. Due to its association with the Nazi regime. Um, has been tainted for many people, even though it's a very ancient and venerable symbol and is found throughout the world, throughout in, the multiple, world. in multiple yeah. cultures. Um, there are a lot of heathen groups, especially heathen groups who have embraced Declaration 127, which we'll talk about later, who have absolutely categorically said that this, this symbol is too tainted to use. Right. That it that it can't really be redeemed from its history. Uh, the other two symbols uh, represent different aspects of, of uh, white supremacy, white nationalism. Right, white nationalism. But what yeah. they what they are is they are variations of the of the solar cross. Right. Uh, both of which are you know very old, um, not only Germanic but. Um, um, Indo-European Celtic symbols. I mean, all, all, again, those are both of those are symbols that are used by multiple cultures. Um, I think that probably the cross, not the one with the circle, um, not the one with the circle, but the, 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 the regular, the, the, the regular cross. That's probably because it's associated with the Iron Cross, which was a which was a symbol that the SS used as a kind of award. And the other symbol is. Um, it's very. It was a. It's a sundial essentially, and so it represented the the in the Germanic four great you know the solstices and the equinoxes, you yeah. know, which would be a which would be a, a way of of uh, you know it's another way of looking at like a medicine wheel here in, in native culture you know in the United States, mm. um, you know it's a very symbol. So basically, these are the three. These are three symbols that have become associated with um, the uh, with the the I would say the uh, the alt right movement uh, movement yeah. um, that, that where they are associated with Nazis specifically right. because there are alt right people that are not um, so the symbols then that the ravens have one of them um, the one if you're if you're looking at this the one on the right the one that looks sort of like a, well, it looks like a fish, the way, yeah. the way that's actually, it's on its side. That's the rune Odal. Mm -hmm. And that particular rune uh, designates ancestral lands and heritage and lineage. Exactly. And um, that's actually always been one of my favorite runes. And in fact, um, you know, part of what led me to come back and here, I'll let you do that. Yeah. Part of what led me to come back and start talking about this stuff again a couple of years ago 
is because that particular rune um, is a rune that, um, well, when I first started, when I was first introduced to runes many, 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 many years ago, 35 years ago or so, it's even been a little longer than that when I actually looked at the, at how long it's been, um, I had a dream about Odin. And in the dream, um, Odin appeared to me, um, and I think I told you this, it, I was in a bakery and he appeared to me as a cookie at first. <laughs> it was like, I was like looking at the cookies and there was Odin and he was a cookie. And I was like, what are you doing in the case? You know, what is that about? You know, and it was like, well, that's where you're looking. And that's the kind of dude he is, you know, he's just very, you know, he'll do what he needs to do. But anyway, he gave me a sigil um, uh, that was based on that rune. And I didn't really understand it. And he just, he said, don't worry about it. When you see this again, um, you'll know. You'll know. Yeah. And so about two years ago, I had a series of experiences. And, um, and all of a sudden, I had a dream. And that sigil reappeared. Mm. And I had forgotten about it, actually, because it had been so long that I just, you know, I'd forgotten about it. And I hadn't. You know, I always have done my own rune stuff, but I had like, you know, sort of left talking about it and stuff way behind. And um, it was just, you know, so I, I said, okay, so there it is again. Okay, what do you mean? So I went to like a meditation and that sigil came up again and it rearranged itself a little bit. And I realized, oh, I had seen it wrong. Mm. And then he said, I want you to heal my house. And I understood that what he meant by that for me was that I that was, was that I needed to begin the process of doing what I could to share what I know about this lore and about these mysteries so that people do not go astray with them in the way that there are powers that want us to go astray exactly. with them. Um, so that symbol is really important to me. And so it's been really difficult to see why and how it's been used yeah. um, by, by, into, by certain groups. And then the other symbol is this one right here. It's, this, is, this is actually, by the way, this is a very stereotypical Marvel comic view of Odin. <laughs> so you, just so you know that. I don't actually experience Odin this way, but, you know, this is how people see him. But if you notice, he's holding... He's holding this symbol. It's called a it's called a Vulcan knot, mm -hmm. and it means. I actually looked this up and did some research on it um, because I was always taught that it meant folk faith and frith. Frith means freedom or peace. The word for peace, the word for free, for the word for peace in Old English means freedom. Freedom, and this is so important. This is why you've got to know these languages. It doesn't mean freedom to do whatever you want. Frith means freedom from war, mm. freedom from conflict. It's very specific because there are several different types of freedom that the language talks about. But anyway, that's how it's come to be seen. Um, and honestly, we don't know what it means. Uh, it's not clear what it means. Wow. Um, it's it, it it it. We know that it is connected to Odin in certain ways. It's also connected to the dead. The word Valk not the word Valk is a is a is a warrior who's been slain in battle. And not just means it's not work. You know, it's been knotted up. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not when I whenever I've seen it, I've always seen it as a way of describing how the how the three main realms are connected. I mean, they talk about like the nine worlds, you know, that are that are represented on the world tree. But those those nine worlds can also be sort of condensed uh, condensed into, into three levels. You know, like like most shamanic, you have the you have the, the middle world where we live, and then the upper world, and then the lower world. And I've always thought that this had to do with how those were connected. Wow. That's how I always saw it. Yeah. And honestly, if you look this up, you'll find like lots of descriptions about what it means. We really don't know exactly. Wow. We really don't know what it means. Wow. Um, and I'm sure that there are some, some of your watchers, who well, I know what it means. Well, I'm glad you do. Because, because <laughs> by all the, means, comment the, on because, what it because, means. Because, this, because the scholars I've consulted concluded that it's not entirely clear what that means. So wow. anyway, but the fact that, you know, it, 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 it is a symbol that's been used a lot. Yeah. Um, in um, certain 
um, heathen groups in the United States, in North America specifically, and also in Australia, and usually with a racialist sensibility. Right. So. Right, and that's why we're here. That's exactly why we're here. So, I mean, now you guys kind of got a gist of what the poster is about. And at least the reason why we had made it and the reason uh, and, and the interpretation by Weheba herself. Um, I'll come back to that poster because there is still one more piece that I found to have be very controversial among people, um, which is the language that was used mm -hmm. in the poster. And we'll get back to that a little bit later because I think that it will definitely be a great segue into talking about some other topics. But, you know, to kind of First, to, before we get into everything, I definitely want to preface this whole discussion that, you know, the professor and I, when coming on here, one of the main things we wanted to ensure and wanted to make sure wasn't misunderstood is there's no idea of calling people out, making people feel a certain kind of way, uh, pointing fingers and saying you're racist and you're not racist and you're this and you're that. It's not about that. This discussion goes a lot deeper than just the surface level idea of racism. It goes, there's a political element, there's religious elements, there's cultural elements. There's, there's so much underneath that surface that we need to unpack and unravel. We're going to try to do our best in the two hours that we're given. But to be honest, this discussion can go on for days. So, you know, bear with us in that sense. And please understand that when we say, oh, these people or these racists or this community, we're not coming at it from a place of, pointing fingers or hatred, we're literally coming at it from facts. This is what's out there, this is the knowledge that we know, and this is how we can try and solve the problem. So hopefully that makes sense for everyone, and hopefully we can start off on a nice clean slate there, right? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Professor, what the main thing I really wanted to talk about first, because my, my audience, um, is, is a lot of newbies, a lot mm. of eclectic witches, a lot of uh, newbie pagans, and also my audience is a large group of um, Afro-Caribbean mm -hmm. and um, Hispanic cultural kind yeah. of traditions out there. Um, so I don't have a huge heathen following, and I don't have a huge uh, Wiccan following that goes towards like Astaru and, and Norse. Um, however, I would love to open the doors to that. And so when we discuss these topics, I kind of feel like we need to kind of hit the basics first. So if you don't mind, can you can you tell us a little bit about, let, let's go back, let's go back in time. Can you tell us about <laughs> the people that practiced these ideas? Because I can't even say that because what we're really talking about is reconstructionism. We're talking mm -hmm. about very modern stuff. Right. So those folk traditions can you tell us a little bit about that yeah um first of all let me let me tell you i'll have to tell you where some of these sources come from yes uh, that would um, be great because uh, a, there are actually lots of sources that are available but unfortunately until very recently a lot of them haven't been available in english um, so you you had you had to know norwegian or swedish or german or you know a a, you know what a, a European language in order to access them, except unless you're talking about um, some of the traditions that are in England, because there actually are some of these traditions in England proper. Uh, and when I mean England proper, I mean the English proper, which I'll right. talk about in just a minute. Um, but what we know about um, the European peoples, first of all, is that. Uh, most of the information that we have comes from two main sources. It comes from archaeological sources, um, and it comes from some accounts of early European peoples, mostly from the Romans. They were the mm. ones that were first writing about about um, really anybody back then. <laughs> well, you know, about about the folks in Europe. Yeah, and you know, because they. You know, the Romans spent a lot of their time trying to conquer different people for a variety of reasons. And so they did finally conquer the area that was called Gaul. They called it Gaul. And that was that was where uh, there was a large Celtic population. And they did manage to get their way into the into the southern part of Britain, what we you know, and they and they called it Britain. Um, or Britain was a name for the Celtic inhabitants, essentially. So a British person originally was a Celtic person who had been Romanized. 
mm. uh, originally. Um, and then, of course, there were various Celtic uh, populations in parts of Europe, the continent, and then Germanic peoples. Now, all of these people that are called Indo-Europeans, who were what who were really talking about, these were folks that came to Europe, into Europe, um, sort of in successive waves, beginning about 2000 BC or so. And then the, the, the folks that we call the Germanic peoples, or that the, 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 um, we didn't, the Romans called them the Germanic peoples, and they came a little bit later. But um, I think what's important for, for listeners to understand is that when the Celts came, and when the, when the Germans came later, and then the Slavic peoples came a little bit after that, um, there were already people in Europe. Mm. Um, and these people, you know, some of these people, we, we know where they came from and some we don't exactly. Um, there were people that had come from the Mediterranean uh, that had already brought husbandry and agriculture into Europe. So when the Indo-Europeans entered into Europe, they were, they were mostly nomadic and they were encountering groups of people that already had all that stuff. And then there were other groups of people like the Sami or the Finnish and the Finnish people and then the Bosques, Bosque people in, in Spain. And we're not sure exactly where they came from. You know, um, we know that the Finnish people are connected to some Central Asian people because of their language. But the Sami are kind of their own thing and the Bosques are kind of their own thing. So, you know, we don't really know exactly where they came from. And they've been there a really long time. So Europe was always a multicultural place. Mm -hmm. in, fa in fact, it was, it was sort of a, it was sort of a, uh, it, there were times when it was almost a crossroads place. And, and then, of course, once the Romans came into it, they, they brought even more stuff in. Right. Um, part One of the sources that is often used to try to talk about the Germans as a separate group, and, and what's important to understand here is that the word German comes from the Latin Germania, and it's just a general term for barbarians. Oh, That's sad. what it means, <laughs> barbarians. Those wow. people that we're trying to conquer that talk funny and, <laughs> and because that's how the Romans saw them, you know? Right. <laughs> um, but the, but the, uh, the source that is often used as sort of um, an exemplar of like who the Germans were um, is a source from the Roman historian Tacitus when he's writing about them. And he's describing these different tribes that the Romans are running into. They never managed to conquer them very easily because these people, you know, the Romans thought they were crazy. You know, you know, they, they let their women fight and, and they fight naked sometimes like the Celts. And then, you know, they'll, they'll burn their own fields rather than let you conquer them. I mean, the Romans just thought they were crazy, you know, just, you know, and so, but anyway, so Tacitus is describing all these different groups and he describes a number of different tribes, you know, and he describes how they wear their hair and, you know, some of their beliefs and, you know, kind of like you would read a colonial thing now, right? And it, that, and it really comes across like that. And one of the things that he says about the, some of the Germani generally, not all of them, but a particular group is that they are, they are, they are unique in the sense that they have never um, intermixed or intermarry. He, he implies that they're kind of clannish. Mm. Okay. And so that was taken, that is often taken as, as an indicator that, that the German people, whoever they were, um, didn't like outsiders and they liked to keep their, their blood pure. And in fact, that was one of the passages that certain Nazis used in order to yeah. justify that. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about that is that if you actually know the way Romans are writing, and if you know some of the, we have some of the responses to Tacitus. Um, what, Tacitus what Tacitus was saying about the German people was controversial even in his day. Um, in, the, in the first place, um, saying that people were clannish and intermarry, and, and, and non, not they didn't intermarry from a Roman perspective was considered uh, proof of inbreeding. In other words, it was not a compliment. It right. was like, it was a way of talking about how primitive these right. people are, that they, they don't even hang out with their neighbors. There's something wrong with them, you know? Right. <laughs> you know? Um, and, but the other problem is that, you know, he's getting all these, 
he's getting all these reports second hand, second and third hand. So he's not, he's not, um, you know, he didn't go out in the field and look at these people himself. All right. So what does Tacitus say about these folks? Well, they live in small groups. They live off the land. Uh, they do some farming. Um, they have some animals. Um, they're, they're gods such as they were, and he describes various of them. Their gods such as they were um, are, are, are mostly concerned with the sun and the sky and, you know. The, the, it's very simple. Yeah, the, yeah but pretty much, you know, yeah. like what we would think of as any earth-based tradition. Right. Um, and what we, the other thing that we, we know from archaeology, from archaeology and also from linguistic studies, folklore studies, is that, um, you know, the, the gods that were worshipped were very regional. I mean, there were some, there were some general things that were, um, you know, I mean, if you've got an agricultural society, you're, you're generally going to have, um, you know, a fertility god and a fertility goddess right. and um, things like that. Or you, you'll have some gods that have to do with war or order or governance. You know, most groups of people have gods like this. So in that sense, the German gods or Germanic gods or whatever were really no different than a lot of other gods like that. Right. Um, now, uh, their, you know, what they, their names varied quite a bit, um, but some, there, were, there were some cool gods, some, some cool deities, like probably ones you haven't heard of. And, and we know that these were actually more important than some of the ones we know of now because they have lots of place names about them. Like the, a really popular play, uh, goddess is Frau Halle. Okay. Frau Hala or Hulda, she's sometimes called. And sometimes she's cognate with a goddess named Bertha, who's a birch goddess. And she was responsible for weaving. And in fact, at weaving and storms, she's kind of a cross between a crone and Oya, if you want to put her in terms, <laughs> terms that, you're, that some of your audience might understand. Uh, she was responsible for storms. She was also responsible for kind of sudden shifts in fortune, mm. good or bad, you know. Um, and you're saying this is in not, not just in German. In yeah, German well, folk, but like uh, it, uh, the, the uh, all, all around. Yeah, I mean, there, there are elements of Caridwin in her um, because he, she is sometimes associated with a pot. There are also elements of, in, in, in um, Russian or Slavic folklore, there are elements of like... Um, Baba Yaga, um, so, and she was extremely popular. I mean, she was like one of the main goddesses because she also was associated with weaving and that whole, and so flax, she was associated with flax, which was um, the, the, the um, culture of which was brought in from the Middle East into Europe. And uh, I mean, if you've ever, if you've ever experienced you know, Swedish linen or Scottish linen, that's where they got it. It's like there's there's a long history of, of flax cultivation right. in, in Europe. Um, and so then so with these with these lesser known gods and goddesses that we that are lesser known to us currently today, mm -hmm. but were so popular back then, mm -hmm. then how did how did the, the gods and goddesses of the Norse and, and you know the, the Odin, the Freya and mm -hmm. how did how did that kind of overtake? Like how did how did these other ones get forgotten in that sense? Well, they 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 weren't forgotten on the regional or local level necessarily. Um, but what when 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 what happened? The reason why certain gods and goddesses are like foremost sort of in our minds has to do with two sort of incidents in history. Okay. The first incident in history occurred um, in the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages. Uh, where in Scandinavia you had, well, it's, it's, we call it the Viking era, basically. Um, what ba There were two things that happened with that. First, you have groups of people going out and raiding. And by the way, they didn't call themselves Vikings. Um, Viking is a verb, and it refers to what they are doing by wandering it's their around. It's, it's their actions, right? Yeah. Um, whoops. That's me. She just exploded. Um, and... 
so the wine. so, so <laughs> it's the wine. <laughs> so so what happens is that there are some of these Vikings actually stay where they end up, where they raid, but some of them, you know, go back home and they take their riches home and everything. And what starts happening is that eventually in Sweden and Scandinavia and parts of Denmark, you have the development of a, a wealthy aristocracy. Mm. And this um, eventually, what happens? I mean, I'm going to condense a lot of history here. There are like <laughs> there are like wars and pushings and pullings and all that kind of stuff, right? But eventually, what ends up happening in Norway and Sweden? Because by by the by the by the um, early Viking period, Denmark is pretty much subdued to Christianity. It's been Christianized by force, by the way, mm. by the sword. I mean, Char it's estimated that Charlemagne displaced or killed between two and three million people in order to force people. To become Christian. I mean, he basically did what we now would now call ethnic cleansing in order to accomplish that. So, um, and these were people who had stayed in Denmark and had not gone to England in the earlier part of the late antique period. Well, the Dark Ages is what we call those, you know, after the Roman Empire falls in the West. Anyway, um, so an aristocracy develops in Scandinavia and particularly in Norway. And um, this aristocracy, there, uh, first, the, the, it becomes a unified kingdom in Norway under a guy named Harold Fairhair, or Finehair, depending on how you, because he made an oath that he wouldn't cut his hair until he had conquered all of Norway. Mm. And, but he was a pagan. And, of course, in doing that, he sets up this court, you know, with, you know, earls and, you know, court, you know, the whole, what a court is. And so, and so um, what ends up happening is that eventually some of the people that he, that he is, that he's trying to get their land from, some of them leave and end up going to Greenland and Iceland. That's the first beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And then later on when Harold, when his court collapses, that sort of sets the stage for Christianity coming in. And they use that court system to then, Conquer, reconquer everything for Christ, essentially. Wow. But what, what happens is in this aristocracy, you develop a literary tradition. And this literary tradition, both, both in Norway, to some degree in Sweden, Sweden develops this a little bit later, and then in Iceland. And out of this literary tradition, you develop um, you know, a poetic tr tradition that is written down finally. You know, I mean, um, we know that the reciting of poetry and being well spoken was a very important component of the of any ruling class in in any Germanic culture. We see this even in England, um, among the Saxons and the and the Angles who become well the England. That's what that's that's what England means. The Angle, the you know the 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 Angle towns, England. You know the English, the English. Um, but this in this literature that develops, um, one of the things that Harold fine hair did was that he exalted Odin above everybody else. Okay. And Odin, I'm not saying Odin was not an important God, but you don't see a lot of evidence on the ground of people worshiping him. There are not a lot of worship places for him mm. around. You don't, you don't find, you know, usually like in England and in, and in parts of Germany and in Scandinavia, you can kind of tell if people had shrines there because they would, the name of the God would remain even after the shrine was dissolved because that's how people understood this road or this crossing, or this hill. everything was named after it, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, and actually, it's no different even here in the Hudson Valley. In the Hudson Valley, Indians, well, yeah, yeah, and it's like Poughkeepsie is an Indian name. You know, there are yeah. so many Indian names everywhere, mm -hmm. um, and some of them have been Dutchified or Anglicized. <laughs> but the fact is, is that you know people got used to those names being there, and so they stuck. Right. And and the same thing happened in in these places, and so it's because of that that we know that the, that that the exterior worship of Odin, you know, whatever that means, was not widespread. There's just not a lot of place names for him. Um, people say, yeah, but if you look in the literature, there's like he's got hundreds of names. They're all literary names. Right. They were given later. They they they, they do describe different aspects of how he is understood, but he. 
but but they're like after you know they're in literature they're not necessarily the way the common people lived in fact we know that most common people paid much more attention to thor and to Frere, and to you know there there if you look in the literature there are two groups of gods there's the auser and the vanner and um, the stories describe the the the, the vanner being there first and they're sort of like earth gods, you know, although they have magic attached to them, but they're like fertility deities and, and gods of the natural processes and stuff. And then according to the story, the eyes are meet them and then they have a big war and then, and they don't really beat each other. They can't. And, and they then someone coexists. Yeah. yeah they have to make it work. <laughs> and, 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 and then they create, they co-create, they co-create a realm called Ausgard, which is where, you know, the gods live, but there still remains a realm called Vanaheim, which is where the Vanar are from. Right. So that realm still remains. And, and we know that on the ground, most common people um, pay very little attention to Odin because he, he, especially later on, he became a god of the aristocrats. You know, he became a god of poetry and a god of, uh, of, of, of all of those aristocratic arts that had absolutely nothing, nothing to, to do, do with what every, you know, what everyday people are doing. And in fact, I happen to know heathens that don't have anything to do with them. Wow. You know, they, is it, would it, would it be, would it be inaccurate of me to make the comparison of the, all the different areas in, in the Indo-European place right we're, we're talking about sweden and and, and well not and, just oh well, indo europeans yeah, are much, whole, broad, much, much, much broader, broader than that. yeah i mean that whole region though. iran india um yeah. yeah but it would it would it be would it be inappropriate of me to kind of compare it to this idea of the native americans here in america this idea of all these different tribes and although there's some similarities in terms of these tribes they are completely, completely different. And you so know, if you were to if you were to go from one tribe to the next and try and, and and say that oh this is this is right or this is what I believe, they'd be like, huh? But then there are also some common elements which we know. Right. Well, they, 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 they would say we, this is how we do it. Right. You know, it's like if you if you. Um, so is yeah. that comparison? Yeah, I mean, in the sense that, for example, if you study the Algonquin people here in the Northeast. Um, uh, Algon the Algonquin people are the Algonquin is a Algonquin when you mean that that's a language family right. so it's it's really vast um, and you know what you can say is that like if you look at the Shawnee and the Lenape or the Ramapo and the Mi'kmaq and the Narragansett uh, you know and all these different groups they all have medicine wheels and they all assign colors to the medicine wheels now, the colors that they assign can be really different. Whether they divide the medicine wheel this way or diagonally, really, you know, they will all vary, but they all have medicine wheels and they all observe certain things roughly the same. So in that sense, yes. Yeah. Right, okay. right. Um, because if you look at the different languages, you know, you have Germanic languages and those Germanic languages include, you know, the German dialects. I mean, there wasn't even one German language until Martin Luther did his translation of the New Testament into German. I mean, there wasn't even, and even now there are dialects. It's like if you go to Bavaria, people will say things, and you're like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it's so different than here, you know. Um, it's like you go down to the Deep South, and you hear these people talking in Deep South, and you know. Even Hispanic culture, you go to like, Argentina versus, you know, what? Puerto Rico, it's, it's it's yeah. very different kinds of Spanish there. Um, well, and then, so you have Germanic, and then you have yeah. then you have the the Northern Germanic languages, the Scandinavian languages, and then you have Icelandic, which is its own thing, and then you have English, which is a Germanic language, and then you have French, which is actually a Germanic language, but they don't like that, so they call it a Romance <laughs> language because it has an overlay. It has an overlay of Latin, but it is a Germanic language. I just don't tell them that. <laughs> Because the Franks were a Germanic people. You just don't tell them that. You're going to freak out. Just don't say it out loud. You don't say it too loud. You're not probably going to get terrible things from people just saying that. That's what they're going to object to. No, the French are not like us. No, no. You know, you know if, you, if you think about some of the world wars in Europe, it's like it's just German people hitting each other as well. <laughs> It's, it's like, what? And, 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 and then even even when you talk about the Rus, the people, the, the Russians, yeah. the Rus were Vikings who just simply went east 
mm. and then intermixed with the Slavic peoples that were there. And there's actually a lot that's similar, you know, they're Indo-European, so there's actually a lot that is similar um, in terms of culture. So these were people that, you know, they were, they, they were semi-sedentary. Mm -hmm. They lived in the forest. It was very forested. They lived in the forest. Um, they did a lot of slash and burn agriculture. They didn't have proper plows actually until the late middle ages when they were brought over when Chinese plows because of the crusades were brought, brought, up, brought, brought yeah. over. Um, and so they, they, you know, they, they lived close to the land and it was, and, but they, they did weave, they did have cloth. In fact, they had fair, fairly sophisticated weaving techniques. Um, so, so for, so for the newbies out here and for people who are exploring um, heathenry and, and the Norse um, reconstructionist religions out here now in, in the pagan world, it's, it's pretty safe to say based on what we're talking about here is that there really wasn't one universal religion of Norse back then. Like when you, when you went back in time, it was different little folk sects that were all over the place that had some common gods but for the most part, it wasn't a unified thing. So, so this idea, because I think one of the biggest concerns that we noticed in the article, what we notice when we observe the pagan community and the heathen community, is this, is this idea of white nationalists, white supremacists, trying to link themselves back to some sort of unified mm -hmm. religious ideology that they can then latch onto and say this is why we are superior so basically what you're saying right now is that it's, it's not really like that it's these little clumps that are kind of everywhere well and people would people you know like most traditional indigenous peoples um, they would spend a lot of they would pay a lot of attention to their ancestors so there was a there was an original really heavy emphasis and you can even see this in the literature on 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 finding, figuring out what the ancestors want you to do. So there were a no, there were a number of, you know, shamanic practices and and um, you know, like you mentioned that I've I've practiced sage. We don't know exactly what sage means, what the word means, but the practice um, appears to have been um, a type of shamanic practice that mostly women did, and that excuse me, and that involved um, a, a full possession trance of some type, but it was a way of contacting uh, the ancestors and, um, and, and traveling in the other world so information could be brought, you know, to, to people who would inquire. And what is interesting, and I actually did a little bit of research to figure this out to make sure I wasn't, was remembering correctly, in the literature that this, this um, practice is, is described, in several sagas. And what is interesting about the descriptions is that according to historians who carefully looked at this, uh, the, the ritual garb that they're wearing um, is, is most closely associated with um, the Finns and the Sami. Mm -hmm. So this, this, so this close shows a very distinct um, connection between Germanic peoples and other um, non-Germanic peoples in a spiritual way. So they weren't that closed off then. They were not that closed oh. No, in fact, let me show you. Like, I'm, I'm going to go get a book now. I'm going to, if you, if you Oh, you guys, book. she brought a, a pile go of books book and resources for you guys to see. Yeah. I'm going to make sure that I take a picture of every single one of them and post them. Um, this the book here, them. Nordic Religions in the Viking Age. There we go. Nordic religions. A little bit of a glare, but you got it. Okay. <laughs> and the guy's name is Thomas Dubois or Dubois, however you want to pronounce it. This guy goes into, he is very clear. He goes into the archaeological, linguistic, and textual evidence and shows how there was very clear exchange between all of the Northern European peoples, um, the Finns, the Scandinavians, the Germans. Uh, in fact, the, re the rejection of the Sami and the Finns, which, which has been a problem in Sweden in particular, um, only really happened during the Christian period mm. because they resisted, they resisted um, being Christianized. And so that became a basis by which to sort of ethnically repel them. 
Okay. But pr but prior to that, there there didn't seem to be a lot of problem with it at all. Um, and there's another book that I have here, which and isn't that was, always the case? There's usually not many problems until until the the raids come in, the Christian right. raids come in, right? This is another one: Witchcraft and Magic in the Nordic Middle Ages by Stephen Mitchell. Um, he talks he talks in here not only about um, the the cultural and spiritual exchanges that occurred um, between Finns and Slavs and Germans, Germanic Nordic peoples, but also once those peoples moved to Greenland, that there is evidence of exchange with natives, even while there were um, fights with them as well. Mm. But, um, you know, the, the natives that were living in Greenland and Iceland, they knew how to live in those <laughs> environments. And uh, there was there was clearly some exchange at certain points. So you know, especially cultural exchanges in terms of like figuring out what to eat and things like that. So you know, the the notion that the notion that the, the Germans or the Norse have have are, have always been closed off and unique and singular and insular, it just isn't worn out by history. You know, and just even the word rune itself. You know, I actually, again, I went back and looked at all my sources. That 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 word appears in both um, Finnish and in Indo-European languages. The, it's thought that it's probably originally Indo-European just simply because of all the, it even occurs in Old Celtic in a certain form. But the Finns clearly use it. And um, it, it, it's, uh, the, the meaning of it um, is exchanged a lot, especially in Scandinavia. So, you know, and, and certainly you find that in Tolkien. Mm, yeah. Uh, Tol yeah. Tolkien uses that connection between Germanic and uh, in Northern European and Finnish uh, cultures in order to craft some of, some of the characters and stories that he, and a lot of people don't know that. That's why they have to find out about him, but he knew about these connections. And so he, you know, he wanted to create this sort of generalized, not only English mythology, but sort of a generalized Northern European mythology that everybody could tap into. Yeah. And so he uses sources that are Finnish and German and English and Scandinavian and even Slavic altogether. In fact, I was, I was so pleased to discover that Radagast, you know, the brown wizard, his name, Radagast, is actually the name of the Vendish or Slavic capital that, that was one of the last, was the place of the last stand against Christianity. Oh, wow. Uh, um, at like, you know, wait, it was, I think it was in the 15th century. Oh, wow. And that was that was the city of Radagast, and that's where Radagast comes from. So speaking speaking of Christianity, because I know you had mentioned um, Charlemagne earlier and his crusades all throughout Europe and and all that wonderful pillaging and, and stuff that had went down. The lovely pillaging, <laughs> right? Christian um, pillaging. Christian pillaging. So so I mean, would you say that? all of these folk traditions were lost, or can you still say, at least in Europe, because, I mean, you, we can talk about American reconstructionism in a minute, right. but in terms of Europe and, and what's happening over there now, is there, is these folk traditions still living, or have oh, they, yeah. have oh, they well, so much been? It, yeah, I mean, it's, it, again, it sort of goes in cycles. Like, like, if you go back, I mean, and this is another reason why I think Odin may have been privileged in some places. Um, you know, the story, the most common story that we have about Odin and his initiation is the one where he hangs on the world tree. Um, and as a, and, and if you if you actually read the text, he's not sacrificed. He's sacrificing himself to himself. It's not to anybody else. So he, did, <laughs> he didn't bring the runes for us. He brought the runes for himself. OK, <laughs> you know, he was you know, he's a seeker that's like looking for power and knowledge and stuff. And it's and it's all about what you know, what he can gain to some degree. Um, but the reason I, 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 you know, and I'm not the only person who thinks this, but the reason why I think that story became privileged in the literature is because of its potential resemblance to Christ hanging to Christ, on a tree. Right. And you can see this actually explicitly in the Anglo-Saxon, um, in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. There's this wonderful poem that exists in two versions called The Dream of the Rood. And um, it's the story of the crucifixion as told from the cross's perspective. 
You know, the cross is speaking. But all the language, but the cross isn't a cross, it's a tree. Because mm. that's what the word rude means, and and um, all of the language that's be, that the that the tree is using to describe the sacrifice comes right out of Odin's that story. Wow. So it's like this really interesting synchron synchronization that occurs, right? So I think that that's another reason why that story sort of became primary because if you actually look at the literature there are other initiations of Odin that are implied but you only get a vignette mm -hmm. you know like when he like when he sacrifices his eye for wisdom at Mimer's well, well it's like well where the hell is Mimer's well you know you start <laughs> it's like it's at the bottom of the world tree well isn't there some other well there you know <laughs> you, you just it gets really confusing you know right. and and that's what happens when you start trying to take it all really literally instead of understanding that these are also ways of describing spiritual processes which you know for some reason we forget that our ancestors were capable of those kinds of ways of thinking we yeah. tend we tend to take these things really literally and say well you know they just they just thought about a tree and it was just like no, no yeah. trees were living beings right. they were living beings think of the ants in Tolkien, trees were living beings that connected you to all the worlds. Right. You do see aspects of this actually that have survived in parts of in parts of, of Europe in different places. And and it's in and not just in place names, but for example, the absolute obsession that the English have with their trees. Right. And they do. They have this absolute obsession with their trees. In fact, there's this wonderful book, which I did not bring. It's because I just thought of it. That's called Anglo-Saxon Trees. <laughs> and, Boom. And, and, it, and it was actually written by a botanist. Right. And, and she is not only describing the trees that are in England, but she's looking at, um, she's looking at the lore of, of the trees, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that still persists. Like if you go to, if you go to England now, even now, you'll go to places where um, there'll be like a field and a field and a field and a field, and in the middle of the field, there'll be just like this kind of crazy place, <laughs> you know, like where there are trees and like just brush and stuff. And that's actually what the English traditionally did because it was thought that that's where the that's where the whites the 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 w i g h t s the spirits of the land lived. Mm. And so you had to always sort of keep a place aside for, right. for them. Right. Um, and you, you, you find places like that all over Europe. I mean, in Iceland, um, they've, uh, well, they only, they, when they Christianized in the year 1000, they Christianized, and it's very specific, they Christianized with the provision that the Christians leave the pagans alone. <laughs> that was its part of it. So, but even today, um, the, uh, I think 50% of the population believes in elves and toward, you know, mm. or, or, you know, unseen beings. And so like, they'll be building a road and occasionally, you know, American. And if it comes across like a fairy, they'll, 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 they'll go right they'll around, just go around it's it. True. You know? It's true. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, this stuff does exist. It continues right. to exist. Um, Which is amazing. So, so then not even Christianity can stop it. All and not even Christianity can stop it as powerful of a force that it is. Um, so I have a two-part question then, if sure. that's the case. So then, sure. just just to kind of dumb it down for the average person and the, the average youth that is embarking in this, you're talking about the history right now. Was there room for racism? Were these folk traditions inherently racist? Were they, you know, did you see that in history where aside from, like, I know you had mentioned the Germanic being slightly closed off, although we find out later on that's not necessarily the case, but is these Nor Norse folk traditions racist? Uh, not in the manner that is normally meant, not originally. Now what happened, and we have to look at what happened. Right, and which is that second question, which was how did it come to America? Right. How did it manifest in what we see today? Okay, well that's, and that's a complicated, again, multi-part, multi-faceted yeah. Break it down for us, girl. Well, well, um, this, this, is what, this, this is what this page is Do about. Do it. Um, um, okay. Because um, when I was trying to think of a simple way of doing this, uh, the best way, let me see if I can just sort of begin. Um, in the late 19th century, there were a number of social forces and political forces in Northern Europe that were converging at once. 
Um, and if you if you look just at Germany specifically, because you know Germany is what is considered to be the great criminal here. Right. Um, if you look just at Germany specifically, what's going on in Germany in the in the mid to late 19th century, and this is the 1800s for those of you who need the translation, because I know some people do. Um, you, you have one of the few places in Europe where, where you don't have a nation that's yet unified. So, so Germany is one of the last nations to unify. Um, I think that that gives them a little bit of an insecurity complex. But then there are other things that are going on as well. So I actually wrote down a list of all the things that were happening in Germany um, from like the, the last few decades of the 19th century for the, through the first two decades of the 20th. So during that period, okay. you have the following things going on. Um, you have uh, this political stuff that I was just telling you about, you know, where Germany is unifying. And let me tell you, you have these little principalities in Germany, like Bavaria, Westphalia, Saxony, and they don't necessarily want to be unified right. at the time. You know, right. it's like, it's like, so who's going to do this and what's that government going to look like? Mm -hmm. and, um, so anyway, you've got those issues. And yet, yet if we don't unify, we're not going to be able to become, become good colonial conquerors like like the French and, and the Russians and the and the English so you know there's that whole thing and then on top of this you have um, throughout all of Europe and much of North America and this is white North America you know I mean the dominant cultures you have um, a, a flood of occult beliefs cultism theosophy spiritism I know spiritism theosophy is actually comes to be very important because um, theosophy has within it this idea of, of the root races. That's the Helena Blavatsky, right, yeah, in her exactly, writings. Exactly. Yeah. And she has this idea of the root races, which I think she means a little bit differently than as they're, they're often interpreted. But the way in which many Europeans interpreted them was that um, was that, that meant that, that certain races were more primitive than others and that um, you know the the race that was on top colonially at the time, which would have been Europeans, that they were obviously superior because they were in that position. Right now, to some degree, um, Theosophy can be seen as a reaction against um, Darwin Darwinism because the that was on the rise during that time. Well, yeah. Dar um, the Origin of Species was published in 1853 or something like that in the 1850s, I believe, and what people's People think now think that what the react that people reacted badly to Darwin because it was atheistic, and that actually was not the reason that they reacted badly to Darwin, especially not in the United States. They reacted badly to Darwin because Darwin was implying that all humans are one species, and and I'm not the only historian to. I mean, this has been borne out by historical works that have looked at this kind of thing. That was the real objection. Right. Was that you know I don't want to be like this guy. I'm well, like well, thing. Well, <laughs> well, what it implies is that the people that the, that the that the uh, that the Europeans are conquering or enslaving or whatever they're doing the that, they, that they are human beings. They are the same species, and it had been very convenient for Europeans to not to think of people that look differently from them as not being of the same species. And that was part of the reason why you had all these racial taxonomies, like from Linnaeus forward in the 18th century that had emerged, all right? So the other thing that's happening in, in Northern Europe at the time is a kind of romanticism. And as part of that romanticism, there, there develops this urge to look back at our roots. Okay. To look back at, you know, who who have we been in the past? Especially if like we're going to become a German nation. Like, is there anything that is there anything that bound us all together? You see that kind of thing. So what happened in Germany was similar in some ways to what happened in England. And I think I've talked to you about this about when the English started valorizing, recasting, and valorizing the Arthurian myths. Mm -hmm. And right, most right. of those myths are actually Celtic in origin, but all of a sudden they become English. English. You right. see, in the 19th century. Well, what starts happening in in um, in Germany is that these are Scandinavian stories, and all of a sudden they become German stories. stories. And not only that, the 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 Grail stuff, which is English and Celtic, Wagner recasts 
in a German way mm. you see so you, you so you get the ring cycle and it's a it, with this weird combination of, of German um, Norse and uh, well some Catholic stuff and then Grail stuff which is you know from it's from Brittany it's from France and you know the Celts and stuff it's just it's really it's actually culturally it's really interesting but it's in an attempt to create a heroic past Right. I mean, that's what it is. It's an attempt to create a heroic past. And so all of these myths that we see get recast in that way. So all of a sudden, Odin starts being seen as this. This big, bulky, this right here. You know, masculine, hyper-masculine, strong. Right. right. But Odin never really looked like no, that. No, in fact, Odin, now this is, not a, this is not a statue of Odin. This is a statue of Thor. But oh, the statue of Odin that is similar to this looked very similar. This is from the, the Middle Ages. Inside. Middle Ages in high That's in, so in, cool. in old Uppsala, Sweden. This is Thor. Um, there were three statues in that old temple in old Uppsala, Sweden. They, they've reconstructed that temple, which was destroyed by Christians at a certain point. And um, th there were three statues. There was one of Thor. There was one of Freyr and one of Odin. And the only way you could really tell them apart was that Odin had the, the hammer. And you see this little pointy hat here. This little pointy hat, little bronze pointy hat. Um, and uh, Odin, Odin, I think, like had one eye covered or something. And then Frere had this big, huge dick sticking up. Word. Yeah, well, a penis. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a fertility dude. Yeah, you know, yeah. So of course he's going to have that. But anyway, so this, this is, this is how the Vikings portrayed the gods. You know, very simple. Like, very simple. Like the, the and honestly, this looks more old and wise. And less hyper masculine. Hyper yeah, like yeah. less punching walls in and more let's read books, you know what I mean? Well, and, and of course, you know, I mean, our whole idea of this, this is so Wagnerian, you know, if right. you think of Wagner's um, operas, this is, I'm, I'm doing this the wrong way. This is so Wagnerian. Like nobody in their right mind would wear a helmet like this with wings. I mean, what the hell is that? And, <laughs> And, you know, and the spear here, which spears are actually really important to Odin, and not to spear your enemies, but because spears were an instrument that were used um, for um, divination. They were spears used, were used for divination. They were, you would throw them up in the air, and depending on how far they went and in what direction or whatever, you'd throw them into a wind, and that would tell you, that would you would divinate oh, with wow. that. And, and, and swords were, I mean, spears were also used, I mean, if you know anything about the grail imagery, right. uh, spears are, are, you know, they're, they're a component of the wounded king. In a sense, Odin is sort of a wounded king. Very much you so, know, um, several but he, times over. But he's also a, he's also a Merlin. He's also yes. a very intense Merlin. And, and it, that was what you were talking about earlier, about the language, his name, and, and, and also regionally how, va how different and vast he actually was in various places. Right. Well, right. I mean, for example, in, in Anglo-Saxon England, um, Odin or Vodin um, and was a healer. He was principally a healer, and the battle, the battle that he would do, the, uh, that he would do battle against infection and against, wow. uh, against you know afflictions, and that's the battle that he would do. So, so then, so to sort of so to rewind. Oh yeah, back, 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 to, back, to, the bringing, century, back yeah, to the nineteenth century. Back to the nineteenth century. Bringing it on. So, over. so oh yeah, I'm sorry. So we get all into that. So, <laughs> ba so basically, and of course, connected to this, you have na you have nationalism. You know, which goes hand in hand with trying to create a new nation and, and then unify it, and unify and you yeah. have and you have growth in anthropology and linguistics. So people are trying to go back and they're trying to look at their folk traditions. And also out of this emerges um, what I what, what's called the the folkious the folkious movement in Germany, which which was a, a kind of a back back to back to nature kind of movement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it very much influenced. Um, well, part of what came out of it was, um, um, uh, well, Rudolf Steiner was part of that movement. If, you're, if the, those of you who, are, who know about Rudolf Steiner and, and Anthrosophy and, and, uh, and uh, uh, what is it called? Um, it's a type of schooling. It's a um, Waldo, the, the Waldo of okay. schooling method. 
um, and biodynamic farming, which was like one of the first types of organic farming. And this was happening where in, in Germany. Germany. Yeah, the time, so all they were totally hippieing out. They were. They, they like, were total, There was a total Greenpeace hippie, movement. There was a total hippie thing. <laughs> total hippie thing, right? And this and this goes into up until about World War One, okay. essentially. And then World War One breaks out. It's a horrible war, and if you and, and the, for those of you who really want to delve deeply into how Nazism took hold and what it is, you just have to know about World War One. I. I mean, mm. World War One changed everything. Changed the game. It, it changed Europe. I mean, yes. um, so and of course Germany was blamed essentially for the whole thing, even though they were not responsible actually for the whole thing, and they really weren't. Um, but they were blamed by the international community for the whole thing because they had kicked ass pretty much better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. They had been more armed, and and so they had done more damage in some ways. And so it was easy to blame them, even though they didn't even start the war. You know, they had just been allied to the people where the war had started. So anyway, I mean, after that, what ends up happening is um, now we have to now talk about what fascism is. Let's please do so. Okay. Yes. Fascism is actually a political ideology that began to develop in the late 19th century in a few little pockets, and it was as a response to, uh, to, to socialism, to the emergence of socialism, and it was also as a response to some of the very, to some of the real problems that were beginning to emerge in industrial nations generally. And what fascism is, is it's, I, I call it at its finest and most developed, which it was Mussolini who actually first coined the term fascism. Um, it's a kind of a, a hyper-nationalism. Right. It's almost a religion of the nation. Um, and uh, and the, way, the way Mussolini finally um, created it, and he was really kind of, and, he, and see a lot of people don't know this about Italy, when, when, when Mussolini was, putting this idea together, he was going back into what he thought were the his ancestors, the Romans and, and some of the some of the, the, the more authoritarian um, um, people in Italy's past, you see. So he was going back to the ancestors too, in mm. a sense. But the idea basically the word fascism comes from the word bundle, which you know you have if you have one stick you can break it, but you have a bundle. You can't. Well, you can't, right? And so it, the idea basically is that you take the modern corporations, corporations, and you and you merge them with a political order, um, but you you get those corporations to work specifically for the state because most people are going to be working for those corporations, so they're actually then going to be working for the state too, and and so you then you have this sort of unified power that that creates this total sort of human force towards some end. Well, how do you keep all this together? Well, Mussolini hit on it. You, you keep this together by having a, a charismatic leader mm -hmm. that sort of acts as a messianic force. Yeah, but we and, had a few of those throughout history. And, and, well, yeah, because you have, you know, you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look in the past, you can, you can see leaders like, you know, uh, uh, you know Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great and, and Charlemagne, you know, people who were charismatic leaders and got folks to do what they wanted to do. Um, so then it just remains, well, what is it, what is it that this nation needs to do in order to survive? Well, basically all of these elements came together in Germany. Now, there were occultists. I mean, there's been a lot of writing that's been done about sort of the Nazi obsession with occultism. And actually, only some Nazis were obsessed with occultism, like um, um, Himmler, for example, who is, of course, one of um, um, Hitler's right-hand men, was obsessed with occultism. And he did employ um, runologists and archaeologists to try to uncover, you know, what he considered to be the secret roots of, of the Germanic people in order to demonstrate that at one time they had been a great people and we were, they were going to be bringing them back. But the problem with that is when you actually went down and looked at things archaeologically, you didn't find anything like that. No. And so, so Hitler was like, Hitler didn't really care. You know, Hitler was like, oh, the Romans were a whole lot better than, than our ancestors were, you know, so we're just going to ignore them, you know. <laughs> So eventually what ended up happening is that the Nazis themselves, with the exception of people like Himmler, 
you know, a lot of the, the runologists and the occultists, they ended up being fed into the camps with everybody else. Wow. You know, so, you know, those, so I will say, right, if there's anybody listening, those of you who are, have an issue, who, who, who have these white supremacy tendencies, who, 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 if you think the current administration is going to give a flying rat's butt about you, think again. They're using you. In exactly in exactly the same way. That's true. Exactly the when same they way. run out of brown people, when they run out of disabled people, when they run out of in, immigrants, when they run out of all of them, they're gonna go for they're, they're gonna, gonna go right through. They're gonna go right. They're gonna go right through poor white people. Yep. You know, and they're gonna and, and don't don't think they won't because Hitler did. Yeah. Um. So, so what happened then after the Third Reich fell? is sort of when the next legend begins hmm. because Tell it. Oh, 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 it's so complicated. Um, <laughs> I mean, you have, first of all, you have to try to understand why the hell Hitler would be made into a, some kind of a messianic figure anyway. Right. Okay. Right. But the fact is, is that he was. And part of this is because, I mean, I think there are many reasons for it. Um, there's, there's actually been a, the last month, there was a New Yorker article about this trying to describe, you know, why, you know, what is the deal with Hitler? Why our obsession with Hitler? And I think that there, like I said, I think there are a number of reasons for it. I think part of it has to do with just how terrible that war was right. and just the sheer scope of what the Nazis did, although they weren't the only people that did horrible things, but they did some very specific horrible things. Right. Excuse me. Um, would you like more wine? Um, no, actually water would be good. All right. So I'll continue to talk and, and she's going to give me some water. Um, well, but um, my hubby will get us some water. I think I think it ha I think it has to do with the symbolic affect of Hitler more than anything else. You know, Hitler is kind of a symbol um, because he he did he did articulate a kind of a dream. Thank you um, for people, um, and and I and that dream I think has a lot to do with finding one's place. Um, because all what he talked about a lot of times was Lebensraum, having room to live, having you know, and 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 uh, having room to spread out. Well, you know where he got that idea? He got that, and he says it in his writing. He got that idea from from America's Manifest Destiny. Ah, mm -hmm. okay, okay. So America, yeah. so so the American experiment of going, you know. Through, through the, the uh, down on the frontier actually inspired him a lot, wow. you know. And so, from his perspective, um, his his understanding of who he thought the Germans were, and especially, you know, insofar as they would magnify him, um, he had this idea, that similar idea that you could sort of, if you could just, if you could just purify a place of anything that opposes you, and set up your own order. Then everything will be cool. Mm. Then you'll have a place. Then you'll have a home. Mm. And um, you know that, that's 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 a story. You know, and, and in a sense, oddly enough, it's the Jewish story. Interesting. Yeah, it's the Jewish story. And and to me, this goes back to some of the occultists and some of the ideas that were floating around in in Europe at the time. One of the guys one of the occultists that influenced some of the Nazis, not Hitler so much, but some of the Nazis was a guy, a guy named um, Lanz von Lebenfels. And he was not actually, oh, about he was actually not a pagan. He was, a, he was very Catholic. And he was obsessed with the Templars mm -hmm. and the Crusades. And so he really had this idea that whatever Germany was going to be, um, it, um, it, it needed to be, religiously understood as a kind of crusade against the rest of the world hmm. that that germany needed to be understand itself as a kind of messianic state you know in much the same way that some some british citizens had embraced something that's called british israelism which is the idea that that the british are the are the real chosen they're the real jews the real chosen people um, and uh, you see that a lot that idea of you know, no, 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 uh, we're the real Jews We're the real chosen people you see that coming up in a lot of areas I mean you'll even find that in the uh, the African community as well, right? Oh, uh, and the Israelite communities you'll see them Popping up saying no, 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 we're the we're the real chosen. Yeah, it's, one. it's like every, everybody's got to be the chosen everyone one. every group <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like the, everyone wants to feel special or, exactly okay. and, and actually I think that that's I think that if Hitler had a talent 
when he did have some, his singular talent was his ability to use media. This will be familiar, sound familiar. His ability to use media in such a way that he was able to uh, use symbols and media and then oratory to kind of lift the average German up to a place where they felt like they were part of something larger. Mm. And so that when and, and so when that when that when that gets shattered and then revealed as the big fat ugly that it was, and some Germans, a lot most Germans knew sort of what was going on. They uh, I mean Germans that lived next to the camp certainly knew that something was going on. But you know, uh, humans have this amazing capacity to avoid things that are, are unpleasant, and so <laughs> they, they just yeah, they just do, you know. So so they it's, you don't have to look upon it, you you won't right. essentially. And and uh, if I close my eyes, I don't see it. It's not there. La 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 la. Yeah, right, exactly. So so you know, once that all collapsed, that doesn't mean that the dream collapses. And not only that what made it makes it even worse and more embarrassing like in a real sense for Americans is when you realize that you know because there was such a fear of the Soviet Union at the time right that um, our CIA took a great deal of time and energy to make sure that uh, lots of Nazi war criminals and officers and scientists would make their way over here in order to get you know pick their brains about you know rocket technology and and all kinds of other things um, yeah because let's not forget a lot of the sciences a lot of the medicines the dentistry right. everything that came out of that nazi regime was very 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 advanced and we it's, it's coming, not coming it's, from this end we're like it's we not it, it's not too far of a leap to understand that nasa nasa's advances in the 50s and 60s would not have been possible without Nazi assistance yeah. and, 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 and not just yeah. not just that but then Nazis that weren't funneled to the United States uh, they they were also funneled um, through a process that was called the rat lines to places in South America and to the Middle East where um, um, Nazi military officials who had run the Air Force, you know, the you know the military in various capacities in Germany, um, were utilized to set up the militaries of Iraq, of Syria, of of, uh, of Egypt, of Israel. Ironically, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in other words, uh, so so in a sense. Nazi, you know, and the, so what that means is that there's actually two kinds of Nazism. Okay. There, there's 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 the influence of of real Nazis in real time who got who who escaped justice, if you will, and made it to the West and in very or Middle East or Asia into Indonesia and places like that, and actually were in positions of power where they could influence. The development of military and and other political actions, but then then you have neo Nazis that start developing in the United States. And let's see when they first started. I actually have this down here, and it's um, recorded. That's in history. history. Yeah, this is that, history. That this is Nazis history. were brought over here to yeah. the West. Yes, in fact, I have. And not only were they brought here to the West, but then they were placed in positions of power. Secret agenda. Okay. This is this book is out of print. It was the first book that was written on this topic. Project um, Paperclip is one of the projects. Linda Hunt. This was based entirely on declassified information. Right. It's not the most interesting read in the world, and it's not very <laughs> narratively interesting. But but there have been several books that have been written about um, this pro project Paperclip and, and other similar projects. So you have that. But then you have. Um, um, or, for example, um, in order to uh, working with the CIA in Europe in order to undermine the Soviet Union, you have um, you have programs like Gladio, which um, basically um, utilized Nazi trained mercenaries um, as sort of secret police that worked with the CIA to undermine you know you know the spy operations that and, and they operated throughout Europe and the Middle East. So anyway, you have all that. But then you have just regular Americans. So that, for example, um, the first neo-Nazi movement in the United States was started um, by a guy named um, George Rockwell. 
And he read in 1951, this is how early this is, he, in 1951 he read Mein, mein Kampf and had sort of a religious experience from it. Um, he, he, he experienced um, Hitler as sort of a messianic figure. And when, you, and when you think about that, it's like, well, how would that happen? Well, obviously he related to something right. that Hitler was saying. Um, you know, you don't, if you have a messianic experience, what that means is that you're, you're experiencing someone is telling your story somehow. Okay. So, um, Hitler, what a guy. To tell um, your story, so he right? had a kind of religious experience and then he, he founded, see, I have to, I have to, I, I'm, I'm so much of a historian. I have to write all this down. Um, <laughs> he founded the American Nazi part the American party, which then became the American Nazi party in 1959. And it was a very small this was a very small organization, you know, because in the 1950s, it's like, you know, the, the people who had fought the Nazis were still very much alive. So it was kind of like, you know, yeah. you, can't, you can't be too open about that sort of thing. Right. Um, and, but probably the, the big change really started happening during the 1970s. Um, um, and one of the most important names in here is a guy named, and you always had the KKK, which was for, if it's, own, you know, this was an American born and bred um you know, terrorist organization. And, and, and if, if you don't believe that, all you have to do is go back to the original charter of the KKK when it was first founded. And it explicitly uses the word terror in describing what its, at, what its actions are going to be. <laughs> so it's like you can't say that this isn't a terrorist organization. You know, I mean, yes, they are, and they always saw themselves that way. Um, but in 1979, this guy named William Luther Pierce wrote a book called The Turner Diaries um, under the pseudonym of Andrew McDonald. And that is considered to be sort of a modern American Mein Kampf. Mm. So if you really want to know sort of the, the underlying myth behind um, American Nazism, you need to read the book The Turner Diaries. What it is is an, apoc it's an apocalyptic fictional, um, it's, a, it's a dystopian apocalyptic story of how the United States um, dissolves into race wars and how this one guy tries tries to survive it essentially um, and um, so it's sort of it's kind of a fantasy um, but is it really though well, I mean we're kind well, of in these race wars even now yeah but but, 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 but what he just well you know, it's it, is it a fantasy or is it what he considers to be like a hopeful? Yeah, seriously, a, 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 a silver lining a, of a, 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 hope, a, a, ho a hopeful future, self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. It's like you know, um, and then he wrote uh, not long. Then after that, he wrote another book um, called Hunter, in in which he um, dedicates to the serial killer uh, Joseph Paul Franklin who was a racially motivated serial killer who operated from 1977 to 1980. So, um, and this influenced a whole movement of people. Uh, well, these yeah, books? yeah. The, the, now this is not, these are, these are not individuals who are necessarily connected to folkish neo-pagan groups, but th this I'm talking about neo-Nazis. Right, United right, States. right. And where it's, where basically, basically how it's starting to bubble up and how it's coming up to the surface. Right, right. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and then finally, probably the single most important event, which coalesced the political, the political neo-Nazi group, uh, and is something that a lot of Americans don't even know about. It, it's called the uh, Greensboro Massacre, and it occurred on November 3rd, 1970. And it happened in Greensboro um, in the Carolinas, I think it's South Carolina. And uh, basically, you had a, a group, there was, there was a, 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 a labor demonstration that was going on. There was a demonstration that was, that was um, being conducted on behalf of um, some mostly black textile workers. And it really wasn't about race, the demonstration. It was about, it was about um, work, you know, workers' rights. It was, it was based on, it was, it was basically supporting textile workers who were striking. Okay. Essentially. Um, it just so happened that most of these textile workers were black. Okay. okay. And the people that were protesting on their behalf or demonstrating on their behalf, they were a mixture of people. Um, they were civil rights people. Um, there were some communist socialist party people there. There was a mix of people. And um, while they were protesting, um, they were met there by a group or by a combined group of KKK KKK 
and um, American Nazi people together mm. that, that um, counter-protested. And then the protests broke up. And while the protesters were breaking up, they were attacked. And five people were killed and 11 people were injured. And um, it, it was the first time that the American Nazi Party and the KKK had worked together. And from that point, they have always been, they have always done their things together. So, um, and the reason that's an important event for me, it was important not only to people in the South, but I actually know two people who survived it. Wow. I know, I know, uh, you know, a, a woman and, and, uh, and uh, her husband who was permanently injured. Wow. You know, by, by one of the, one of the people that was shot. So uh, that was, at, you know, and actually the Greensboro massacre is remembered in, in the, the, the white supremacy movement as kind of the, 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 the culmination, the culmination of, of when these forces came together. Now, wow. what does this have to do with paganism? Well, I will tell you only sort of what it has to do. Oh, we got to build it up, you guys. We have to let you know how it all comes together. Got to know the history. It's important. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I mean, history is really part of this. Um, the, the first pagan groups, um, or Germanically oriented pagan groups, actually developed separately. They were not part of what the Nazis were doing. Um, and they developed in the 1950s. And um, they were initially the, the first ones. Um, let me just give you the names of a few. A few. Um, the, one of the earliest ones um, were group were um, heathen groups or the, or nests nests if they if you want to call them that that were associated with the Church of Our World in 1962, mm -hmm. which is one of the oldest neo pagan groups in in the world. Right. And they did have some heathen nests. In the beginning, um, and there were also, and then in the 70s, um, you had a number of groups. Um, there was one that was started by a guy named Yost Turner, um, and then it was also in the night, early 1970s. I think it was 1972 or 1973 that the that um, Stephen McNallan um, founded the group, the Alza True Free Assembly. Now, there is one text that pulls all of this together. And this is the text that is called The Morning of the Magician um, by uh, the authors of Powell's and Beguer. And the reason this is an important text is that it's, it's the book that creates the myth that the Nazis were occultists, that they were pagan. Which is a very pervasive myth. It, it, you see that yeah. absolutely everywhere. And and I know that there are some people who have read this book and they'll say, oh no, this book says this. And it's like, no, this book says this, but that doesn't mean that that's what happened. Okay? <laughs> Isn't that always the case, right? And, okay. <laughs> it's because, written here, though, so it must be real. <laughs> right. It's not what happened. Uh, because, and, and, um, and actually, a really good book to talk about this in a way that would make sense to you, even though this book has other problems. Okay. So She's it's just not, getting it's not my most favorite book. But um, um, in fact, we just interviewed this guy two nights ago. It's called The Return of Odin um, by Richard Rudgley. The modern Renaissance. And this one has some pros and cons too. Yeah, I mean, it's got some other issues with it. Yeah. But after interviewing him, I kind of understand why those issues are there. But one of the things that he does is he talks very specifically about this myth, where this myth comes from that the Nazis were pagan. So what ends up happening is that people who may be interested in heathenism now and looking at the specter of Nazis, they have they they're like, well, the Nazis were pagan and they were into the occult, it's like, well, no, actually they weren't. Some of them were. Right. Some of them were. Um, they did use some occult symbols, you know. Um, so do we. What do you think's on the back of your damn $1 bill? <laughs> right. You know, the, the whole pyramid eye thing, you yeah. know. It's like. But that doesn't mean all of the American nation is pagan. Right. Or, or, <laughs> or, or, or that we're, you know, Knights <laughs> Templar Rosicrucians. Exactly. You know, it doesn't mean that at all. So, um so yeah, they, they use these symbols, but in fact, the rank and file, the rank and file um, um, Germans were not. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, the Nazi state required on the required were it banked on the complicity of the of the Roman Catholic and Lutheran Church. 
um, in order to accomplish its goals. So, you know, the vast majority of Germans were not into the occult. You didn't have like this little cadre of occult pagans, you know, doing these things and, you know, so, so that's the book that creates that, that myth. myth. That wow. myth. Yeah. Now, and then that myth is unfortunately perpetuated in certain groups. Um, and the group that probably is the most, uh, you know, that has been the most persistent in this regard has been the one that was started by Stephen McNallan, um, which is now... Which the Astero Folk Assembly? The, it's Ausatru. Ausatru. The Ausatru Folk, Folk, Folk Assembly. Um, because they've been the most blatant about it. I mean, there are other smaller groups, but in fact, most uh, most alt right groups, a lot of alt right groups that are associated with white supremacy, frankly, are Christian identity groups. Mm -hmm. They're not pagan at all. So then, how is this how is this happening then? Like, how is this being infiltrated? Because it's like you said, it's been going on since the fifties, sixties. How is that well, happening? it's there, there. I mean, I can tell you what happened with the. I can tell you what happened with the. Uh, in the 1980s, you have and Diana, Diana Paxson and I, who I'll talk about in a minute, has have actually have conversations about this. In the 1980s, there was kind of an explosion, if you will, of interest in in um, heathenry, and you can see that in. Um, now, what, what this guy does is he says that it's he says that it's the Odinic archetype that it's reasserting itself. <laughs> um, Diana and pa Diana Paxson and I have concluded that this this was this was Odin going, hey you guys, geez, we got to do something. There's climate change, you know. <laughs> that's you know that that's the way that's the way we understood it, you know. But all of a sudden there was like this explosion of interest in the runes, and you can see it in like mass market um, publications, like you know um, Ralph Ralph Bloom's. Oh yeah, I remember being a newbie pagan and like right. everyone was doing runes. Every, everybody at that time. was doing the runes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And then not long after that, a guy named Edward Thorson, and that's his pagan, it's, that's his heathen name for a, a guy named Stephen Flowers. Um, he, uh, he had just gotten his PhD in Germanic literature and languages. And so he started, he cre started creating a career for himself talking about runes. Now, the interesting thing about Edred, and I can say this about Edred because Edred just changed it. I knew Edred when. And in fact, I have, where is my book? Where is my, here's my book. I can show you that I knew Edward Wren. This is the original title, the, the original cover of Rune Lore, okay, that when Edward wrote it. And and you got it signed? And, and he had signed it for me right Get there. Get out. Right there. See? My name was Tika at the time. But I don't know if you can see it. Nah, it's too bright. I'll take a picture of it with my phone and yeah. post it. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it there is. There it is. There it is. Nice. Actually signed it, you know. For Tika, learn to read the runes aright. <laughs> so he had this idea. Edward had this idea that the that um, the Alza True Free Assembly that he did have connections to. This is down in Texas. That they could that that, that he could sort of create a, a, a college, if you will, to teach people about. Norse stuff or, you know, Germanic stuff. The problem is, is that some of the stuff that he was translating and some of the things that he was connected to were Nazi things or proto-Nazi things. Like he translated the works of Guido von Liszt, who was an occultist that some Nazis used. Um, he translated some of the works and the philosophy of Carl Villigat, who is the occultist who helped design the death's head ring for the SS. So, you know, he was sort of dabbling in that too. Right. Even though he himself, you know, I don't know. I mean, because what ended up happening in the late 80s is that he actually broke with the Alza True Free Assembly. I left the Alza True Free Assembly myself um, because um, they were openly espousing homophobia and and um, interrace, interracial marriage. I mean, they were just, I mean, they were, and they weren't espousing that. They were condemning it. And I was just like, that's crap, you know. So I, I I left eventually, and what ended up happening is that Edred left too, and he left for two reasons. He left first because he had joined the Temple of Set, which of course, for those of you who don't know, is a you know is, is the second iteration of the Church of Satan, 
Um, and it, it's actually a pretty interesting occultist um, organization. But anyway, he had joined them. <laughs> but he had also helped to found a, a group called the Troth, and, which still exists. And the Troth is actually an association of a, a huge number, hundreds now, of different groups, of different kindreds and hoffs that are all connected to heathenry in one way or another. And um, the purpose originally of the troth that he had it was it was going to be like this university where he was going to like train a priesthood and everything. That never that never developed. But what the troth has become is an organization um, that is, that um, they meet like once a year, they have like a group meeting, but it's a, it's sort of a place where people who are interested in heathenry generally can meet other people that, that, that um, engage in heathenry of various types. And it's sort of a, a, a nexus for information, you know, linguistic information, historical information. So it's sort of, it's sort of like the SEA for heathens. But the neo-Nazi narrative is not, is not no, floating. No, in no, and no. And in fact, in fact, the, uh, the trough was one of the first organizations to sign on to something that is called, although this was always a part of them, but they've made it more explicit on the website. Um, they, they've adopted something that is called declaration 127. Um, which is a declaration that um, I can't, I don't know, I think it was like in 2009 or 2010 when it was formalized, but it's a, it's a, it's a statement that unequivocally um, separates um, heathenry, as, as these people understand it, from those heathens who practice what they consider to be racialist or racial heathenry. So you basically, at this point, you have, you have two, possibly three forms of, of heathenism. You have the racial heathenism, um, as exemplified by groups sort of like the Ausa True Free um, a Folk Assembly, um, which has become even more militant, actually, in the last few years. Um, Stephen McNallan has gone to Europe and has, has you know, been uttering imprecations against all the Syrian immigrants, which have been coming. I mean, you're Europe. seeing these groups popping up all over. You're right. seeing you're seeing the movements in Poland. You're seeing them in Sweden. You're seeing right. them, even in Canada. You're seeing right. these movements well, pop up. Well, actually, there have always been some of those folks. In Canada, yeah, but, but they're like militant and violent right. and, and protesting out there right. in the streets. So, I mean, just to make it clear for those of you who are just tuning in, so what what Heba is talking about right now, Declaration 127. Um, basically is where all of these heathen, well not all, but a majority of heathen groups are coming together. They've created this declaration to say no to the kinds of heathen, heathenism that is associated with this neo-Nazi kind of movement. And they're signing this declaration along with a few other articles that they've, uh, that they've made. Um, I believe there's also, um, what, is, what is it called? The shield wall. Yeah, as, as part of that as well. So there's there's other amendments to this that everyone is kind of jumping on board. So for those of you who are interested in, in terms of what can you do about it or what are heathens already doing about it so that you understand that it's not like a passive watching of their religious traditions being taken over. They really are trying to fight against this. It's, it's not part of their system. And, and, and just so that you know that that's what Declaration right. 127 so, is about. Yeah, well, and not, not only that, Declaration 127 goes even a little further than that. It's like, um, so you have these, you have, like I said, you have these racialist groups like the Ausa, Ausa True Free uh, a Folk Assembly. But then you have um, the, like, associations like the Troth. And those, those who have accepted um, or signed on to 127, a Declaration 127, basically what one, a Declaration 127 says is that first it enumerates what the reasons why they are separating from these groups, from like the Alza True Free Assembly specifically, or Folk Assembly. Um, and they basically say it's because they have openly espoused homophobia and 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 anti black 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 fire um, um, bias and I mean th th there's if you if you go if you actually Google Declaration 127 you'll it'll, it'll come, come up yeah for but, sure. but the most important thing is that they 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 put this this is important because they put this in the language in a very specific kind of language that used to be used in Germanic Norse and Anglo-Saxon communities when they were putting someone under the ban. 
Mm. And this, this language basically says, look, you have the right as an organization to govern yourself in the way you see fit, but we are not standing with you. You are standing alone. We, we, we unequivocally separate ourselves from you. Yeah. And not only that, they actually quote one of the sayings of Odin in the Havamal, where he basically, where basically he's saying, you know, if you see someone doing a misdeed, you a miss a real misdeed, you call them out and you give them no frith. In other words, you give them no freedom, no peace. You know, you basically call them out and call them out and call them out and call them out. Right. You know, it's not a call to terrorism. It's a call. It's a call to calling someone out. Exactly. And then stonewalling at the end of the day too, putting that cold shoulder up and saying, no, we're not with this. It's like, no, this is not. A, this is this is not negotiable. Right. This is not negotiable. Right. Well, and thank and, you, Elba. She she actually linked a Declaration 127 very in good. the comments. Very, very good. So uh, check that out. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I would love to, I want to get into the resources and the ways in which you can participate and the ways in which you can um, really, really take part in this movement and, and protect this culture. But I kind of want to hypothesize with you for a little bit. Sure. I really do. I want to get into, whoa, 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 whoa. I really want to get into the psychology of this all because the, the fact of the matter is, look, these articles were written in 2017, 2018, which tells me something. That tells me that with the new political climate that is here in America right now, with the president that we have that's emboldening these kinds of cultures and these kinds of ideologies, right, and really empowering these movements to be more vigilant and more out there, um, obviously these articles were written because there's a concern. Mm -hmm. There's a huge concern. And so I would like just, just to hypothesize with you and want to know your opinion on why is this why is this happening mentally why do they feel why are people feeling like in order to feel pride within themselves that they also must be superior and exclusive to everything else like why why is this happening well i mean I mean, look at, look at, I mean, I mean, there are lots of psycho, psycho, possible psychological reasons for this. And I mean, and this is not a new phenomenon. It's definitely not new. I mean, you like know, you said, you were seeing this back in the 80s right, as well. Right. I mean, it's. Um, but I just feel it's bigger now. It's it's much well, more it's, it's, in your uh, face well, now. well, it's it's more visible. More visible. I, 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 really don't know, I, I really don't know that it's bigger. Um it's more visible, more visible and, sure. and, and certainly social media makes it more visible. I mean, one of the things that I always remind people about is that it doesn't take a lot of people to make a ruckus or to make a change for the good or the bad. You know, if you look, people talk about, you know, people who look at, at American history, they talk about the rise of the conservative Christians or the conservative right in the 1970s and you know for those of you who may be old enough to remember this remember the the moral majority and you know Jerry Falwell and 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 how that helped elect Ronald Reagan and all of that kind of stuff but what's it you know and so and so you know we, we would say now that the religious right has been really influential in American politics right, right for now, sure now we would say that but if you actually look at statistical breakdowns of how many people in fact are fundamentalist Christians or even identify themselves as such, they have never been more than 15 to 16 percent of the self-professed Christian population. Right. So, you know, we're talking about a small group of people who because they have mastered mass communication, they are capable of making their grievances um, what we all think about and talk about. Right. All right. So uh, basically, uh, I think I, what what I what I suppose has occurred. One of the things that has occurred is that for at least for some people, at least for some people um, be, who especially get most of their news off the television um, or off the internet, con especially conspiracy radio, because you know. Um, um, extreme politics, whether it's on the right or the left, is always about conspiracy. <laughs> you know, right. you know that goes that goes all the way back to that goes all the way back to John Locke and Rousseau. So you know, I don't <laughs> have to worry about that anymore. Um, but um, 
you have these individuals who they're tuning into mass media and, and suddenly they're beginning to experience what people of color have always experienced. They're mm -hmm. beginning to see lots of people who don't look like them. Mm -hmm. Lots of people from lots of other places. And of course there's a disjunct with disjunct there are disjunctions with that because you know you may be you may be a butthole and you may speak for president or whatever his name is. What I'm not gonna call him a president in 45. That you guy. May, that guy. <laughs> you may speak for him, but you may still really like Mexican food, you know, or whatever, right. you know. And so because that's the way American culture is. Um, but what happens is that people, they start feeling like they're left out of the equation. And the fact is, is that a lot of poor people who are um, into some of these groups. Um, so the groups, average American folk, the, average, like the way that they did in Germany, trying to reach out to the average German exactly. to lift them up. Exactly. We're seeing that now here again exactly. in America. Exactly. Because one of the things that the National Socialists did, which is, those were the Nazis. By the way, they were socialists. They were socialists, okay. <laughs> national socialists, uh, um, and you know, and they did, and they did lots of socialistic things, like they had universal health care if you were a good German citizen. You know, they they had lots of things that are considered to be terrible and leftist now. But but anyway, um, um, you know, the, the one of the things that they that 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 um, political party learned right away was that in order to get the common people in order to to really in order to really get their point across and to gain power they had to they had to disconnect the common working person from an understanding of what they were really doing so it's like you're doing your work but you're now but now you're going to be this work is going to be linked to a bigger cause and mm -hmm. if it's linked to a bigger cause you have more pride in that you have more pride in that you're more invested in that yeah. and somehow that's going to pay you back in the end mm -hmm. you know you're going to get yours and at first with in germany um they did for a little while you know the common everyday working person did manage now the professional managerial class didn't do so well and in fact if any of you are interested in what the actual effects of nazism on everyday lives were there's a guy you can you can read his books his name is sebastian hefner and he actually describes in detail what it was actually like to live under hitler and you know um, it, 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 it was but in here you're but here in America you're seeing those same right. patterns exactly exactly there and there are only and everyday working class people are the ones that are going to get crapped on yeah you know like they always do so um, so in an attempt to you know to uh, to sort of regain that power and in an attempt to sort of regain their identity they'll say we're white but we're white yeah but we're white <laughs> But we're white, <laughs> and like you were saying, you know, seeing things on TV, seeing seeing the world now changing the narrative where they're no longer at the top of the food chain. All of a sudden, that white fragility well, comes well, out. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, actually, they still are for the most part. But they totally, don't, but, they but don't they're think that they are. they're being yeah. But the messages, like you yeah. said, the messages they don't that feel that to way. Them, they don't feel that way. Exactly, that way. are making it seem like oh, this is my suffrage. This, well, is, this is our time. Right, right. And, and, and you know, they're not as high on the food chain as they were. But the people that are high on the food chain are not people of color. They are other white people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it's, it is. It's, it's, so it's like, you know, it's white people who are jerking you around, you know. It's not black people who are jerking you around. It's not people because they're still struggling too. Right. You know, it's just that more people are struggling. And some of the people that are struggling are white people now. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Um, but you know, and so they they're trying to reach back into history to mm -hmm. try and reclaim that identity, right, try and reclaim that power, right? And because the, the reason why I'm asking, okay, so the reason the reason why this is all coming up in my mind and why I really want to know the psychology behind all of this, because like I said earlier, um, you know, the majority of my audience is you know African Afro and practice African diaspora, Afro Caribbean um, traditions, and a, a lot of times are eclectic and newbie witches as right. well. And, you know, one of the observations that I'm seeing in our community and some of the complaints that I'm actually getting from, um, from these other traditions is that they're now seeing an influx of white individuals wanting to be initiated in these cultures, in these traditions. 
and wanting to gain access to these cultures that up until five minutes ago, they were completely against and didn't want anything to do with that culture and were for the most part thought that those people were subhuman. Now granted, I am not speaking about all white initiates, please get that out of your mind, but what I'm saying is that I have seen and observed the complaints of individuals who have noticed people wanting to come in that were not coming in for the right reasons and not with the respect of those traditions and those cultures, but instead coming in to access that power that is in those places. So this desire to have this power and the psychology of it all is really why I was trying to pick your brain with that. Mm -hmm. And another reason why in the the poster, I was getting a lot of complaints from people. I was, I was getting a lot of people saying, Leilani, why didn't you say in your poster, hijacking of heathenism as opposed to hijacking of paganism? And I think it's really important for people to know that me and my husband who made that poster chose those words very specifically because they aren't just hijacking heathenism. They are starting to spread out into other cultures and other traditions in the pagan community um, for that power. And so, I, I, yeah, I definitely course, want to hear well, your point on well, that. Well, I think what you're talking about is um, what is commonly called cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. and, and you said a word the other night. What you said a phrase the other night, girl, that I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book on that. Well, you're going to have to remind uh, me of what was that word. Uh, spiritual imperialism. Spiritual imperialism. Say it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, groups, um, individ I mean, I first of all, I have to say that I think it's really, really normal for humans First of all, to be curious about what other people are doing, of course, spiritually and culturally. Yeah. I think that, you know, journeying, I mean, searching. Yeah, and it's and it's pretty clear that you know our European ancestors were generally pretty curious too. Yeah, you know, they traveled broadly and widely, and and they they were interested in all kinds of things. And you can even link that back to the the verb Viking and this idea of traveling and, exactly and, and, and trading with the Arabics and, and all over the world yeah, yeah exactly so I mean I think it's perfectly normal to be curious I think that what you're talking about is a situation is a it's, it's you know and we and I gave you some examples it's a situation of where you have individuals who are spiritually searching themselves in one way or another and they um, they see what other people are doing and it looks interesting and it looks powerful and so they want to learn they want to learn about what that is and then they may go and they may instead of contributing back to that group or helping that group grow or becoming a member of that group in some way they take they take some of that for their own and they just take it off and they use it in certain ways and you know, so not always is it a malicious situation sometimes it's, it's malicious it's a genuine sometimes, search, sometimes it can be a, sometimes it can be a, a genuine curiosity um, where where it becomes problematic I mean and this is a, obviously this just isn't in the Afro Caribbean community but mm -hmm. like where I've seen this a lot is in the New Age community where um, people appropriate um, Indian stuff and by Indian I mean from India Indian stuff or Native American oh know, my gosh stuff. say it girl and and, and I'm 100th and 116th Cherokee so therefore I'm a shaman oh yeah <laughs> over, over the weekend over the weekend over the weekend yeah, take, take, take a shamanism workshop and I've, and I've got my guide animal now and hey look, all we're, for we're, it. We're, we're all set and I'm gonna hang my shingle out and teach other people how to be a shaman. I went to India, took some yoga classes, and I, wear a bindi, and now I'm all for it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's like, yeah, it, yeah. And you know, and the reason, and I mean, and the reason why people can do that is because, of course, they have this sense of privilege. A privilege, uh, right? About it. Now, you know, it's. I don't know. You know, on an individual level. Um, you know, if, if white people come into a certain group, um, you know, it's, it, I think it's really important that groups figure out ways in which they sort of um, understand or police their mysteries. You know, I mean, different native groups have very, you know, they vary in terms of, of what they will give to outsiders and, and not outsiders, non-Indians and, 
Um, and they, they argue with each other about it, you know. So I think that this is sort of like an ongoing converse, oh, totally an ongoing conversation. And I would be the first to say, and in fact, you know, I, I, my, my, my reemergence back into this two years ago was initiated by um, a native teacher who I was going to at the time. Um, and I still have a few native, you know, I, I, I have, I am blessed with some native teachers who have given, who have gifted me with some of their their teachings. But I was I was actually um, studying a little bit under this one native teacher, and she's she's um, Nanticoke and um, Welsh, that is her background, and uh, she was talking about ancestors, um, because of course she her ancestors come from lots of places, and actually so do mine. I mean I only look white you know I mean, I'm actually mixed in my origin it's just that all the white genes planted themselves on me um, but she 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 was talking about the grandfathers the grand she to grandfathers and the grandmothers you know of the ancestors and she said it's really important to seek out all of your grandparents right and and I thought about that and I thought you know that's important and so I, so I, I, you know, I, I thought about, because what I had been doing was I had been, I had been, I had been doing some native stuff in appreciation for one of my grandfathers who, who was native, principally native. And he, um, you know, he suffered a lot because of it and, and, and died really young. And so, and went through a lot. And so I was, I was trying to sort of honor him by, learning so and and i and i do feel like i do you know by by doing some of the things that i do but um i realized that i had sort of i had sort of the other stuff had sort of fallen by the wayside and so so i started investigating you know my ancestors again and it was not long after that that i had that dream right. so i do think it is important i do think that there is an ancestral component that people are looking for and so when they go to these other traditions it's because some of these traditions still have some of that well, some of these traditions are still living. Exactly. You know, they're exactly. ancient, ancient, yeah. ancient, but the people are still alive, practicing right. it exactly right. the way it was practiced. Right. And see, and, and see, for lots of Europeans, some of that, even though if you go back to Germany, you go back to Scandinavia, you go back to some of these places, you'll find vestiges of it. It is true that in many cases, this this contact was broken. And so I think that I think that people are searching for yeah. that and I think that that is a real search um, and I think I even think that some of the the reasons why some people get really militant and racial about it is because you know they feel like they have found some of that and and they feel like it needs to be protected from pollution like like it can really be polluted you know for me it's like you know the ancestors are there for everybody Exactly. You know, they're for, they're they're there for everybody, and, and and in fact, the way that I was taught to call the grandparents, the grandmothers, and the grandfathers, and this is by a native teacher. The way he taught me was, you know, because, um, you know, we as he said it, we all now have lots. Many of us have lots of different grandparents, you know, from many different places, especially if you're in America. You know, have lots of grandparents, lots of many places. So he says, when you when you turn to the east and you call on the grandmothers and grandfathers, think about all of the peoples that are that come from the East. If right. Whatever you think of as the East, whether they're animals or plants or humans or all the ancestors, and then to the South, and, and, by do, and then to the South and the West and the North, and by doing that, you end up including everybody. Exactly. You know, it becomes multicultural, it becomes multi-inclusive. Right, right. Yeah. And and but nobody's left out, you know. Right. And 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 that is, I mean, and, and of course that is a native adaptation to reality. Um, but that's what this guy has chosen to do. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, and that's sort of a recognizing of the reality that that people are searching for this kind of thing. So, you know And the search is, you know, and here's the thing, you know, the search to find oneself by going back in history and going back in time is a noble search. It really is. And honestly, it's something that I, w I personally would encourage everyone to try and do. But there comes a point where there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a line, there's a threshold where you go from 
searching and, and finding self to, like you said, when once you find something that you relate to and that you find is yours, to now becoming a militant fundamentalist kind of, you try to put this bubble around it to protect it. And it's really easy to kind of fall into that trap because you can't really bulletproof a religion or bulletproof like a culture, meaning you can't make it anti-Nazi or anti-racial. You really can't because a lot of these texts a lot of these religions out here, if you dig deep enough, you can find a way to turn words around to really fit your bigoted ideas if you really, really, really wanted to. Well, humans and they can, do. Well, well human, humans can do whatever they want to with whatever yeah. they want to. I mean, um, you know, um, if you think about if you think about the ways in which, you know, Christianity or Buddhism or any of these larger traditions have been used, um, and part of the reason why it's possible to use them is because they are, in fact, so thick and so rich, and they have so much in them. But you see, if if people, if when people are wanting a, a, a little, when people are wanting a little world, a little place where they feel safe, and I, and the reason I feel like I can speak to this is because I grew up in a in a religious family that was almost cultish in their in their sort of insularity. And um, now I was taught that, you know, um, Catholics were the Antichrist. And, and, <laughs> I remember, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I, I was taught all these, you know, and, and, and it's like, you know, my, I wasn't taught that black people were bad, but I was taught that Baptists were bad, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, anybody that wasn't us, there was something wrong with right. us. And, and, you know, the fact is, is that my, my, family, my family wasn't bad. They were just wrong. Yeah. And, and if, and, and if, if you feel like you need a really tight little place like that, like, like Stephen McNallan seems to need, I think it's because he feels unsafe in the world. <laughs> right. You know, and, and on some level, I mean, the way I read that is on some level, you don't trust your gods. On some level you don't have faith. On some level you don't yeah. have faith that 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 spirit is going to help you through. Say it, you know. Um, Say it. Because that's the way most fundamentalists are, right? You know, most fundamentalists um, feel that way because they feel like you know the world is just too scary of a place, and so you know we have to kind control of control something. We have to control something. We have to like make a little enclave where we can have our own little place, our own little. And it's it's so. So middle school, <laughs> you know, it's like an adolescent move. You know? It really is. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, when I was twelve, I needed to do that. But, you know, once I got a little older, the blanket fort. Exactly. Yeah, it's the blanket fort. You know, uh, and and once I got a little older, I realized, oh, you know, if 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 the spirit is in me, these things are in me. Then I'm safe right here. Then you're, here. Safe. you're, you're good. safe right here. And you're safe no matter where you are. And you are who you are no matter where you are. And you're safe with whomever you're hanging exactly. with. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, 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 and their different cultures and their different colors and their different languages don't have to don't have to automatically freak you out. I mean, I'll admit humans can be freaky. But <laughs> you know, um, I think you know, but I've always been more freaked out by the white people than I have uh, you know, because because I just you know, I just don't. I, I've never understood that that fear. That I guess fear, yeah. that that some people have about that. And but, you know, my biggest but, my biggest concern, um, and the reason why this video to me definitely was so important, is like I said, the majority of my audience is a lot of new witches, newbie pagans, right? And my biggest concern is that a lot of these new pagans really, you know, when they're coming into this, they're not coming into this with any political views. They're not inherently to the right. They're not, it, it, they're not looking to identify with Nazis in the first place. But what ends up happening is the material that they are exposed to gradually kind of sneaks in that, that racial, racist, you know, narrative and causes them to sort of start parroting that information thinking that it's coming from a place of source for that particular culture mm -hmm. and so i guess what i'm trying to ask you right now is 
what are some good sources for newbie witches, for new people that are coming into the heathen traditions and that are interested in learning about this? And even for old school who just never got around to, to knowing that there's good source information out there for you guys. Okay. What can you recommend for us? Well, I've recommended some things. The first, let me, let me go over here. <laughs> She's okay. got to go get them. Like, I'm going to get on my Because <laughs> I think this is really, really important. I think, you know, the education is really where it all is, you know? Okay. And when you're not educated, you're, it can easily fall into fundamentalism. Right, well, right. Um, first of all, I showed, you, I showed you this book here already, The Return of Odin. Now let me explain. Um, let me explain the good and bad parts of this book. This book is really good in tracing the um, uh, the, the the myth that that um, that the Nazis were pagans. Okay, so that so that is, so it it gives you like a good a background of that, and also a really good background of where. Um, neo-Nazis in, in the United States came from. Perfect. The, the, the problem with this book is that it's not, it doesn't talk about um, heathens that are not this way <laughs> in the United States. So if you, were to, if you were to read this book, you would think, oh, everybody who follows Odin is like this. And that is completely wrong. That is completely wrong. Right. Because um, as we established earlier on, heathenism is not inherently racist. It no, isn't. No, it is not. And, when, and and I would recommend as a as an online source um, the trough, which I've mentioned. And you just just Google the trough. That's T R O T H, and it will take you to. I because I I think it's the trough.org, um, and the trough is a huge organization. Um, it's got many, many branches, and one of the people who's been involved with the troth is Diana Paxson. So she actually wrote her own book on Odin. And she's got a few books out. She's got quite a few books. Um, she, what, one of the, is, see the Falknotter right there? See? I see it. You see it? Um, <laughs> the, um, and see, this is he. he the the eight-legged horse. The eight-legged horse. By the way, um, Odin's horse, Schleppner, that name means slipping, the slipping one. He can slip into all of the different worlds. That's what that's about. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, Diana Paxson was instrumental in the 1980s in re uh, reestablishing and reconstructing the practice of save okay in North America and she and in fact she's written several books that deal with trance work and possession work I would recommend all of them I think she's a very good writer so she's like the main one she's like go, she, go she's, she's an a main American one yeah she's and, she, and in fact she has a workbook Called taking up the runes. If the runes, we haven't talked. I'm getting about, that, by the way. We haven't talked a lot about the runes, but this is probably probably for an American. Babe, this, get me this one. This is the one I want. Uh, for, an, <laughs> for, an, for an American, this is probably the best book you can get. Taking up the That's runes awesome. by Diana Paxson. Um, in terms of European stuff because there is a lot of new scholarship that's being done in Europe at the, at this time. Um, the person that I would recommend as probably the best individual to help you understand the source materials more accurately okay. is this woman here. So the archaeology, the mythology. Well, well the, the, written, the, real, the, the written mythology. The real trust The, the of written it. mythology. This woman, Maria Kvilvog, uh, Cedars Bigdrasil, um, this is actually based, this book is actually based on a series of, of YouTube videos, of YouTube videos. So it's not linear. Um, so you can actually just pick it up and start reading it in any place. But she does linguistic analyses. You know, when I was telling you at the very beginning about all the different, what all the different names of all the guy, the, 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 she's the person who's she's pi the one. pioneered. That's awesome. The, 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 the way this way of re and that is not a skinny book, you guys. So be ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, it, the fact this is she's got a new edition which I haven't gotten yet that adds a little to this. Um, and then, but the, but this is a nice. This is a nice kind of be, um, beginner's book that she's put together. Um, these are six cosmology poems that are taken from the Poetic Edda, which is considered to be one of the textual sources um, for the Norse or heathen tradition. And, uh, and she um, subjects these, po those, these poems to this translation um, awesome. matrix. It's very well done. Um, in fact, I, I can't even, I, I sit and I read these and I just, you just kind of like go, whoa. 
It's just like wow. you just go to these other worlds. It's it's almost like going into trance reading her. Now, um, if you, now if you're interested in more cultural things, this this guy is what I consider to be the best modern um, scholar in the English or Anglo-Saxon tradition, which is actually where I do some of my stuff. Um, his name is Stephen Paulington. Uh, he's actually a scholar who has figured out that he can make extra money writing things for pagans. <laughs> Um, and which is and and he's written his number. This is called the Elder Book, the Elder Gods, or the Other World of Early England, and this um, incorporates textual, linguistic, and archaeological material together yes. into one fairly readable text. Nice. I mean, it's actually pretty readable. He's got a good sense of humor. You guys, I'm getting like hot and bothered at the fact that she has all these books here. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally, totally loving books. this. You have no idea. <laughs> and, and for those of you who are interested in in, in Odin Woden as a healer, um, he talks about this is this is a book that has some of that information. Oh, as the heal the healing charm. Oh, babe, I want this one too. <laughs> yeah, early English charms, plant lore, and healing. It's it. I, this book is exhaustive. I mean, I will tell you, it's oh, exhausting. Oh, but I want it. That's it's, awesome. it's, it's, I mean, I'm still going through it because this is something that I've just started to do. Um, and if you're interested, for those of you who are interested in just sort of like how people lived, this is a, an excellent book on just how people lived, the Mead Hall. So it, it talks, so whether, whether you're interested in, 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 in how, Courtly, uh, uh, courtly systems got were established in in uh, Scandinavia, or the courts. The early court system was established in England, um, where toasting came from, or how this all fits into um, uh, Tolkien's work, and and also the movies of the Lord of the Rings. This is this is actually an excellent book, and it's based entirely on archaeology and, and literature. Um, it's, this it, was actually, this book in particular was assigned to us, because I actually took um, the, what is it called, um, the Tolkien series class uh -huh. in college. So right. we did all of Tolkien's material, all of Tolkien's source material, and everything about him biography-wise as one of my English classes for my comparative religion degree, and uh, that was one of them, and it's phenomenal oh, for, yeah. sure. It's, 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 for sure it's, it's, and it's fun it's a fun book yeah now for, for other other people let me just pull out a few things here <laughs> um, she's got so much if you're interested in more um how the heathen traditions linked to other northern european traditions in other words what are some of the common the common elements now, nigel pinnock is great for this um, he, he specializes in the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, and Scandinavian stuff, but he also does stuff on Baltic seas, um, some Slavic um, information, Finnish information, and some Celtic information. So, um, and he's written a ton of books, just a ton of books. And he specializes in actually going to places where people still do stuff like this or, the, or they write rune staves like in buildings and stuff like that. And so he's he, it, so if you're if you're interested in knowing what people actually do still, he's really good for this. This is his book on rune magic. Oh, I have this one. This is a great book. It's a different cover though. Yeah, it's actually a very good book. And it and it's a good introduction to all the different types of runes that there are. Um, if you're if you if you're aware of Edward Thorson, who I have mentioned, mm -hmm. Edward Thorson, um, who is now who is not going by Edward anymore? Um, after after he um, he became um, a steer, the, one of the first steersmen of the troth when the troth was formed, he left the Alza Tru for his folk assembly and went on to the, form the town. I mean, not form, but to be part of the Temple of Set. Since then, he has left, and he has basically left the heathen community entirely. All together. All together. Gotcha. Um, I could have sworn. Is he the same one who eventually found his way over to Vudan? Or is no, that a whole no, different? Th that's a different guy. Okay. That's, that's Michael, I got him confused. My, 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 Michael Berteau, I believe, is who. That's who it was. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, Edred, Edred, <laughs> Edred, um, Stephen, Doctor Stephen Flowers 
um, has become what is called a Mazdian, which is the only thing that a non-Zoroastrian can do to practice Zoroastrianism. You can't convert to it, right? But you can become a, 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 a Mazdian, and so that's what he has done. And before before we get on to other books, so those, so for those of you who want to donate, be a part of, research more about what you can do to be a part of this movement to kind of stopping and, and, and kind of putting a halt to these racist uh, movements coming into the heathenism and coming into paganism. There's a, a few organizations. We have Heathens United Against Racism. Mm -hmm. We have the Asatru Community. Um, those are the two that I got so far. Are there more that I'm missing? Oh well, yeah. If you if you go if if you Google um, Declaration 127, it'll have 180. And, and there, there, there's like 180 groups. 180 groups that are listed in, there in 20 countries. That you all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can go to their specific websites. You can go and learn about them and their charters and donate money or or be a part of what it is that they're doing locally. Um, so look that up. Okay. All right, sorry. Go okay, ahead. no, that's fine. <laughs> and, 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 but Edred's, a lot of Edred's rune books are still in print. And actually, even though some of Edred's stuff is problematic, and I do consider some of it problematic because um, a lot of people don't know that the runic theory that he teaches, the runic theory that he teaches, is actually from Guido, a version of Guido von List, which has nothing to do with what it has nothing to do with uh, what. Um, traditional practitioners pract practice, but some of his books are still okay. This one is good. This one is his book on divination. It's I have a question here Ooh. from Charles Portisfield. Uh huh. Do you happen to know Jonas Gardebeck? Um, I have heard the name. Okay. I, I could. We could. We could do a quick Google search to remind me. Okay. I've heard the name, but this book is pretty decent. It's just a book on divination, and it's pretty good. And um, this book, if you get this book, you'll have all of his books all hooked up. <laughs> nice. So it's like he's written a bunch of other books, but if you're interested in, in Rune Lore, just get this one and and all of his theory is there. So you don't need to worry. So I think, is there any, is there a last one that you want to close off on? Because well, we hit two and a half hours already. Oh, okay. Well, Woo! well, let me. Yeah. The, the, what, <laughs> what, what I would mention is, is just to remind, uh, there's a, uh, there's also another his, um, a person who is pretty. Um, she's she's dead, but most of her, but a lot of her work still is uh, in print, and it's a a, a woman named um, um, Hillis Davidson. Hillis Davidson. And 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 a lot of her work is still around, and she basically is a pretty good historical source. Thank you so much, Elba. So Elba linked us all to the Facebook group of Heathens United, and she also linked us to the um, AsatruCommunity.org in the comments. So make sure you check that out. Elba, you are fabulous. I love her. And 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 also, <laughs> if you're if you're interested in just the two main texts, the the two the main the, 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 the the literary texts. There's a bunch of there's gobs of sagas, okay, but the principal text is this one. Which is the Poetic Edda? I have that. The Poetic Edda, and actually, it's in several translations. Yeah. This one is probably the most um, poetic translation, but it's also the hardest to read. Uh, and uh, then, then there's also the, the Story Sturluson's Edda, which is often called the Prose Edda. You see here? Here's here's Mr. Oh, Thor that's guy. the guy. Mr. Here's the Thor guy. Thor there guy he right is. here. Thor guy. <laughs> Now, when you're reading, when you're reading this book, it's really important when you read this text to understand that Snorri is um, compiling stories from several sources, many of which have been lost. Um, but he's also compiling these stories within a Christian context, and um, he's also um, writing this um, as he puts it in his in, in the very beginning. He's writing this for young court poets who want to learn the art of poetry. Oh, that's so, beautiful. so, yeah. so basically, this is considered a literary work. Okay. Okay. So it's important to understand that. But anyway, um, that other, is awesome. Other other oh, author goodness. other authors are Brian Bates and Ralph Metzner. 
have done some important work in this area. So yeah, so we're gonna. So what I'm gonna do is when this video is over, I'm gonna compile the list of these authors, the list of these websites. Um, to, I'm gonna try and take pictures of some of these books, and I'll put everything in the description for the YouTube video. Okay, okay. Yeah. so um, that way you can find all of those source material there. So once again, I want to thank you so much for doing this with me tonight. We did right. two and a half hours. We tried to, to condense as much information as possible in here for you guys. Thank you to those of you who joined us from beginning to end. You guys are amazing, amazing, amazing. And um, we. I hope you have a wonderful night with Heba. I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Oh uh, yes, we can do we can do other things together. Soon. Maybe we'll do a part two. Maybe part we'll do two, something else. Or actually do something else entirely. Yeah, something else entirely. Let's, let's, if, let's if, you, if, if you want to know what UFO conspiracy has to do with it, that's Woo! a whole other thing. You know what? Give me <laughs> give me your comments, give me your ideas, throw some stuff at us, and if we can find a good topic to talk about, I would love to do a part two with you for oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. All right, guys. You have a wonderful night. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Bye. Right. Oh, is it raining?